us talk to Jay Smith back with you again. We've um, This has been a fascinating pandemic, uh, lockdown, where we're all at home, and most of us uh, are looking for things to engage with, and I've been getting an awful lot of requests uh, from you and from those who are on my email uh, to engage with this uh, area of the historical critique of Islam concerning the beginning of how Islam all began. Remember, we have always had this problem with Islam, with a man named Muhammad, uh, and also with the city of Mecca, with the religion itself, as far as the people call Muslims, and of course with the Quran. And we've always wondered why is it that everything we see about these five areas are all referred to in the 8th and 9th and 10th century, but not in the 7th century where they existed. And this has always been a perennial problem for those of us who try, are trying to find out how Islam really began. We don't trust those 9th and 10th century uh, biographies, the Siddha, or the sayings, the Hadith, or the Tafsir, the commentaries, uh, or the histories, the Tahrim. We've, and we've always asked this. As historians, you always go back to that which is the closest to the event, uh, hopefully to the originals, or to actually uh, the eyewitness account of who this man Muhammad was, what he did, what he said, and where he went. But we can't, and that has been a real problem, because none of that exists. None of this material on Muhammad, or on Mecca, or on the Quran, all of this either comes from the 8th, or the 9th, or even the 10th century. And so uh, uh, over a month ago, back on April the 19th, I decided to just zero in on the 7th century, zero in on the very beginning, looking at that century and looking only at artifacts from that century. And I've been putting up, trying to put up video after video because you've been requesting it. Uh, most of you are in lockdown. You have the time on your hands to look at these videos. And I've just been interested in what we can discern from that century, not from the 8th or 9th or 10th. I want only the 7th century. That's the century that Muhammad was living. That's when he died. That's when the Quran was put together. That's when he supposedly lived in Mecca. Uh, that's when he claimed to be, according to Islamic traditions, that he was a Muslim. And that supposedly is when Islam really birthed itself. Took uh, It took on the the image of Islam that we see today. That's what the Islamic traditions have always been telling us. So I'm back there looking and delving into the Astanami, these letters from Muhammad supposedly, uh, looking at the con uh, constitution of Medina. And when I've been looking at that, I've also tried to ask, well, what, are, what do we know about Muhammad himself? And that's why I brought Robert Spencer on board a few days ago to have this interview that has gone really viral and it's been terrific and people who have responded and there are many questions. Nonetheless, who is this Muhammad? What is this Islam? Who are these Muslims? Where is this Mecca? And where is this Quran that Muslims keep telling us about from that century, from the 7th century? Well, about a year ago, I was at a large conference in Poland. It's called the uh, European Leadership Forum. And back there in 2019, right a year ago, almost still today, they asked me to do a, a workshop on this very question. And I did a two and a half hour workshop, which they put up on YouTube. They just put it up two months ago. It's been up on YouTube for only two months on their FOCL, Focal site. And already 115,000 people have watched that workshop. Now, that ELF forum is now starting today, today, the 22nd of May, a year later, but it's not in Poland today, it's actually online, because everybody who is, would be going to that conference has, you know, has had to stay home in all the various countries all over Europe, and also here in the United States, and in Asia, and Africa, and other places. So there, there is nobody able to go to Poland right now, so they're doing it online, and I asked a request, and I asked them if I could take that workshop that I did a year ago, which is all about what we're talking about right now, and if whether I could put it up onto my site. If I could look at that workshop and let people see it, because it would not only fit in with the rubric of what ELF is doing right now in this next week, it also comes from ELF. It's already up on their site. 115,000 people have already watched it. I wanted this, my people to see where I was a year ago. Now, this was 2019. Remember, we're in 2020 now. We're in May 2020, exactly a year later. And this is the problem in some ways with historical criticism. Historical criticism keeps changing because new material is being found. Uh, I didn't know a year ago about the coins. I wasn't aware about these letters. I did, well, hadn't really <coughs> looked at the inscriptions. This is all new material that we've come to light, that has come to light in just the last year. And what I say today, even in, or I am saying today in May 
uh, or June or July uh, in 2020, I will have to move on and continue to, ex uh, to embellish that because of new material that will yet come to light. So what I want to do is I want to share this workshop that I did a year ago. I want to share it with you now, uh, those of you who are watching my channel. It's a long workshop. It is two and a half hours. Uh, it is owned by ELF, European Leadership Forum. It is up on their focal uh, YouTube site. There are two other workshops that I did there, one on the 10 most often asked questions, uh, and also a, a, the 20 logical fallacies. Uh, those are also up on the website. I think about 24,000 people have watched one of them. Another 12,000 have watched the other. So they're becoming very popular, and they're just moving right up the scale, proving that there is a real desire to understand Islam historically, there is a real desire to in uh, to engage with Islam publicly, and because of the fact that this is such a popular theme, it makes sense therefore to also put this in many different platforms. So I will be bringing those videos uh, of those workshops. I will be putting them up on Fander Films at a later date. This one, however, deals with exactly the topic we're dealing with. It deals exactly with the seventh century. It uh, asks the question: How then did Islam begin? Or as I title it, where is the man? In search of the man. In search of the man. You know, where is Waldo? I'm asking, where is Muhammad? And so this workshop tried to look at all that we are now uh, coming to, all that has been given us, all the different artifacts, the different uh, letters, the, uh, the buildings, the manuscripts of the Quran, looking at what we now know, uh, that was a year ago, what we know then, concerning what we think or how we think Islam began. Not what the traditions are telling us, not what the Siddha or the Tafsir or the Tahdiq or the Hadith are telling us, what actually did happen from the sources of that century. That's the historical uh, work that everybody should do and what we want to continue to do here at Fander Films. So sit back, take out your notes, and try to engage with the material that I'm introducing. I do go into an introduction of why I'm asking these questions, who I am, where I come from, and also the need for apologetics and polemics. So I do a kind of an introduction before I get into the real meat of this question. How then did Islam really begin? What do we know about the emergence of Islam? Okay, I'm going to stop there and let you get right into it. This is Jay here on the 22nd of May, 2020. So you can see the date and let's see what we know today and what we're going to know in the future. This is Jay. Over and out. Whenever these videos get put up on ELF, they, on their focal site, the Muslims grab them and they pull them down. And then they unpack everything I've said, and then they take me on, and it's great fun. So I know this is all going to be, you Muslims, you're going to take all of this stuff and you're going to pull it down. And this is one way to engage. In some ways, it's a good way also to be peer-reviewed. Uh, this is a way of being peer-reviewed. I know that hundreds of Muslims are going to see what I'm going to say today, and they're going to put up videos. I'm going to have to then respond to them. And that's how we learn, and that's how we actually increase. And uh, so it's, it's great fun, this kind of interaction. Uh, gonna, let me give you a background as to why and who I am, so you understand why I'm saying what I'm saying, because it may disturb you, especially being European, this kind of talk. Uh, I grew up in India, was born in India. Uh, my parents were missionaries, my grandparents were missionaries. So I'm third generation Mishkid from India. My parents, my grandparents, went to India in 1913. My parents' graves are there, my grandfather's grave is there. They never left India. They loved it so much and uh, dedicated their whole life. And to uh, understand why Islam, all of North India is mostly Muslim. So having grown up in Northern India and having had Muslim <coughs> roommates, uh, I've, had, I've grown up with Muslims in my school I did all my first 12 years in India, and then I left India. And when I remember when I left, I, I was so glad to leave India and so glad to leave all the Muslims because they were very aggressive. They were, any discussion we had, it was always the Muslims against me. We, and so I've grown up my whole life debating. That's why I have no fear of Muslims. I love them. They're the most engaging people. But I didn't at that time, in 1971, 
And I was so glad to finally leave and go to a place called America. Now, my accent is American, right? But this I didn't get in America. I got this in India at a missionary school called Woodson. Moving into the American accent, I have to use that in the West. And it's that background that prepared me for what I'm doing now. I didn't plan to go back to the Muslim world. I married a, a Mish kid like myself from Kenya, Judy. Here's her picture here, my wife. And uh, she grew up in Kenya. I grew up in India. We met in America in undergraduate studies. But we, after we got married, we were, I was doing postgraduate studies at that time, and I went to a seminar, a one-day seminar, something like what we're doing today, on Islam. And we were told, back, this is 1981 now, so we were told back in 1981 that there were 800 million Muslims. Huge number. How do you compute a number like that? Too big. But then we were told that there were only 1,500 missionaries working amongst them. Now that number I could, I could compute. That was a small number. And we were told that 1,500 only made up 2% of all missionaries. So worldwide, we were sending only 2% to the fastest growing religion on earth. And those two numbers were like a slap in the face. And I turned to my wife and I said, what in the world are we doing wrong? Why is it we're only sending 2% to the one religion that's attacking us at our foundation, the one religion that is growing faster than any other, the one religion that is taking over the world? Now, that, back then in 1981, it was still pretty much in the Muslim world. There weren't that many Muslims in the West yet. And so we went to our mission board and we said, listen, send us to the Muslim world. And they had no work with Muslims, which was symptomatic of the very problem. So I, we were seconded, that means we were lent out to SIM, which used to be called Sudan Interior Missions. Now they call it Society of International Ministries. And they sent us to Senegal, West Africa. By this time, I had already, I had a master's degree in Islamics from Fuller Seminary under Dr. Dudley Woodbury. So I thought I knew everything I needed to know about Islam, having grown up with it, having had a master's degree in it. And I went to Senegal. And the re reason why they sent us to Senegal is because no one else wanted to go there. Because you have to learn two languages to go to Senegal. You have to learn French, and then you have to learn Wolof. So we went to work, we went to work amongst the Wolof people, and I immediately realized that my training did not prepare me for this kind of Islam because this was a very much of a Sufi Islam. It's the confreries, the brotherhoods, the Qadriniya, the Tijaniya, the Murids, especially the Murids, which was an indigenous organ group of Muslims. And every one of these brotherhoods had piris or marabus. Marabus would be like sheikhs. They would be authorities, but they became a a, a mediators between God and man. They took on the role of mediation. Now that I had never really studied. I didn't, that doesn't exist in Orthodox Islam at all. In fact, it's anathema in Orthodox Islam. And most of these confreris, these Tijaniyas, these Qadraniyas had come out of Iraq and had filtered down through West Africa. And remember, in West Africa, we've had Islam there since the 11th century. So it's a very old form of Islam. While we were there, and we had get dedicated to get five years there, and we started a church in Wolof there in our front room, and we were the first Wolof church in Senegal. It has now uh, daughtered two or three other churches. But after five years, we got a, mess, uh, a warning, or not a warning, but a call from our missions office saying there's a real problem in London. Now, I looked on the map, and London did not look like it was in the 1040 window in the, that window that you think of uh, the majority of Muslim populations, the, the 10th and 40th parallel. London was outside of that window, and I couldn't figure out why there were a, this large group of what they call radical Muslims. And they didn't know how to deal with them, and they didn't know, no one, no, the, none of the missionaries had ever come across this kind of Islam. Well, I suddenly perked up and said, hold on a minute, radical Islam, those are my people. They're the ones I love. They're the ones I work with. That's what I'd grown up with. Do you understand what I mean by radical Islam? Well, what's the word radical mean? Give me a definition of radical. A radical number is what? Root. Root. There you go. So let's use that definition. Radical Islam would be the root of Islam. To be a radical Islam means to go back to the root. So what would be the root of Islam? There you go. And the model for this book? Okay, so the book on the mat. 
uh, the book of the man would be the root of Islam. And this, is a, this was created by a man named Ibn Taymiyyah in the 1300s. And he was the one that actually defined real Islam. He said, to be a good Muslim, you must read the Quran and you must follow Muhammad. The book of the man, the book of the man. 1300. Remember in the 1500s, 200 years later, a man in Germany said much the same thing about Christianity. His name was Martin Luther. Nailed up those 95 thesis on the Wittenberg door. Remember that? What did he say? To be a good Christian, we must sola scriptura. We must only come back to scripture. Who, which is modeled on Jesus Christ. And we call that our reformation. And I've heard so many people say, when is Islam going to be reformed? And I said, folks, it got reformed before we got reformed. They beat us by 200 years. Ibn Taymiyyah is the foundation for Islam worldwide. All, all your radical Muslims go back and they quote him. The reason why is because there were two men in the 1700s, one named uh, Ibn al-Wahhab, Abdul al-Wahhab. Abu Wahhab was living in, in Medina and he was studying in Medina, 1700. So you're talking about, well, 400 years later. With him was another man named Wahiullah, who had come from Bihar in India, Eastern India or my grandparents worked. Now, they weren't living in 1700, obviously, but back in 1700, these two men were studying Ibn Taymiyyah's material, so they were inculcating this whole paradigm of going back to a book modeled by a man. To be a good Muslim, that's the definition. Al-Wahhab stayed there in, he remained there in Arabia. He then amalgamated himself with a family called the Ibn Saud family. The Ibn Saud family then eradicated all their enemies and took over the entire peninsula. But they were nothing more than a political control. They needed some, uh, they needed a religious uh, uh, re uh, authenticity. And that's why then they brought in Al-Wahhab because he became, he gave them the legitimacy of theology. And that's where Wahhabism started. So Wahhabism is based on even Wahhab. That's where the name comes from. 1700, look at your dates. That's 400 years ago. Meanwhile, Wahihula went back to India. And he, um, back in India, he's the one that started the madrasas all over East India. When the British came to India, his disciples were so strong that the British had to contend with them. And what the British did is they just moved them right across over North India over into the mountains. And so they fled up into the mountains, the Hindu Kush and the Himalayas, where they still are today. And that's why places like Waziristan, where the Pashtuns are, all this North frontiers, Northwest frontier, that was all became strongly radicalized Muslim, all based on Wahihula's teaching that was based on Ibn Taymiyyah's teaching. So this has been around for a good 700 years. This is not new. Now, let's jump to the 20th century. In the 20th century, then you had, there in India, you have two names that you need to know of. One is Maududi, who lived in northern India. In fact, he lived um, very close to where I grew up, before me. And in the 1920s, and the 19, up until the 1940s, he was in the, um, in the city of Deoband, which is between Delhi and uh, where I lived, up in Masuri, up in the mountains. I remember whenever I'd go back to visit my parents from boarding school, the train would stop there in Deoband, and there'd be these huge madrasas on either side of the railway tracks. Now, being a young kid, I didn't really see the significance of these huge uh, madrasas. I now learned about more about them now that I've left. But it was fascinating because he then in 1947, when India got its independence, he then took a move from India and moved over to Pakistan and started the Jamaat Islami. And the Jamaat Islami then took over many of those madrasas in the northwestern frontier. <coughs> and they created huge schools of training, all training and teaching Ibn Taymiyyah's material. Go back to the Quran, modeled by the Prophet Muhammad. Their students were Talibes. Talibe means student in Arabic and in Urdu. The Talibe became the Taliban. The Taliban then moved into Afghanistan, because that's all Pashtun, they're all the same tribe. Moved into Pakistan and threw out the Russians. That's probably where you all came into the picture. That's where many of you then were, were living and you know what happened once they threw out the Russians. 
Meanwhile, in Delhi, in, well, even before that, in 1920s, a man named Muhammad Ilyas. Muhammad Ilyas was another very radical Muslim who had been brought up on Ibn Taymiyyah's material. He had been heard about all the Wahihula. But we're now in 1920s. He started another group called the Tablighi Jamaat in Delhi, capital of India. And remember, at that time, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh were all one country, created by the British. So that was a huge block of Muslims right there in one country. In 1947, then it became three countries, West Pakistan, India, and East Pakistan, or the other way around for you, West Pakistan, India, and East Pakistan. So here you have the Tabikli Jamaat growing in India. You have the Jamaat Islami growing there in Pakistan. That's what's happening in the Indian subcontinent. Now this group, the Tabilki Jamaat, has grown and grown and grown since 1920s, 1924, so almost 100 years. It now is in 120 countries and it has a membership of 80 million. Let me repeat that number, 80 million. That's a big number, isn't it? That's the population of Britain right there. Those are the Muslims I had to contend, I have been having to contend with in Britain. Most of the radical Muslims I'm engaging with are the Tabikli Jamaat. It was the Tabikli Jamaat that came and blew themselves up and killed 52 people in July 7th, 2005 in London. Do you all remember that? That is the Tabikli Jamaat. Most of the attacks that we've been getting in London and Manchester were just celebrating yesterday or today the bombing of Manchester. Uh, that was yesterday, I think. That was the Tabikli Jamaat. So almost all the attacks that we're getting in Britain are infused by the teachings of the Tabikli Jamaat. These are the groups that you, none of you have heard about and you never will hear about because you're not engaged in that level. Most of you have only think about Islam as being Arab. You're not thinking about the Indian subcontinent. The Indian subcontinent is by far much greater, much bigger than anything in the Arab world. And it's the Indian subcontinent where we're getting all of our attacks against Christianity. There is not one well-known Muslim Arab who is attacking Christianity. Name me one. Let me give you the names of all those who are attacking Christianity. <coughs> Ahmad Didat. Is he Arab? No. He lived in Durban in South Africa, but he's from India. Zakir Naik. Go up on YouTube, put his name there. Thousands of videos by him. He's from Bombay. Probably the most prolific today. Shabir Ali. No. Lives in Toronto, but he is from India. Adnan Rashid from Pakistan. Mansur Ahmad from Bangladesh. Most all of the best known debaters today, polemicists who are attacking Christianity, are from the Indian subcontinent. And there's a reason why they're from the Indian subcontinent. Two reasons, really. One is because they were colonized by Britain, and being colonized by Britain, they have grown up with the English educational system. From middle school on up, everything is in English in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Unlike the rest of the Muslim world, where everything is either in Arabic or whatever the local language is, Indonesian or all the rest. But secondly, because British, British, Britain is a Christian power, they have already engendered and ingrained themselves on how to attack Christianity. And they saw quickly, much quicker than the Arabs world, that Christianity was Islam's greatest threat. And it stands to reason we're their greatest threat. Because we stand against everything they believe. We stand, if you look and see the two religions, when you look at them and you do a comparison between Islam and Christianity, Christianity on every, in every major case stands against Islam. So can you see then why in the Indian subcontinent this has gone much quicker, much faster? And the other reason is just look at the numbers. Just look at the numbers of Muslims in Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. If you just add up their Muslim, not Hindu, not anything else, just Muslim population, you have over 650 million Muslims. Look at the numbers. There's nothing that is as big as that. Nowhere else in the world is as big as that. Indonesia only has 200 million. The whole Arab-speaking world, the entire Arab-speaking world is only 270 million. 650 million just in one block. And yet we're not doing anything, hardly anything. No one wants to go to the Indian subcontinent. So that's why I've dedicated and done most of my work on the, in the Indian subcontinent. That's why I have to work in this area. Because when you work with Indians and Pakistan and Bangladesh, you have to engage in the historical critique. 
The reason why is because they're using it. No Arab, I've never met an Arab that attacks me historically or that even defends Islam historical. They don't even understand that there's a problem there. And the reason why, it's not that they're not intelligent enough, it's because there's, Christianity is so small and so weak, it doesn't even appear on the radar. It's not a threat to them. There's no threat. Whenever I'm at Speaker's Corner, for 25 years, I would go every Sunday down to Speaker's Corner, and I'll be there this next Sunday, in a few days, and we would engage with whoever's in front of us, and almost invariably, if I'm talking to an Arab, I'm just gonna go in a circle with them. They, won't in, they have never heard of the Trinity. They won't even know about the Christology of Jesus, about authority of Scripture. They don't even know that that's a problem. None of these things, even, they've never heard this. They have no idea that Jesus died on the cross or Issa died on the cross. These are things that they don't think about. They want to talk about George Bush. They want to talk about Trump. They want to talk about politics. They want to talk about Israel. They want to talk about anything but not theology because they don't believe that there's a problem with theology. They don't even know that we have a difference in theology. So I don't engage at that level with them. Well, that's not quite true. I make sure we engage theologically because I'm not there to talk politics. I don't care dilly swat about politics. That's not true. I do, but not when I'm engaging with Muslims. If I have a Turk standing in front of me, I have to tell them what they believe before I can even take them on because they have no idea what they're to believe. <laughs> if I have a North African, either a, somebody from Algeria or, and we get quite a few from Morocco that come through, I have to quickly switch to French and then we go at it. But they all want to talk about the French colonial system. They all want to talk about how terrible the colonial system is. They don't want to talk theology because they don't think theology is important. But when I get somebody from Indian subcontinent, anybody from Pakistan, India, or Bangladesh, I have to take a deep breath because I know I'm in for a real battle. And they will have Bibles in their hands. They never have a Quran. They never bring a Quran. They only have Bibles. And they have little post-it notes all the way through with seeming errors or historical anachronisms or scientific problems. God bless them. Aren't they great? I'm so excited when I see a, a Muslim with a Bible in their hands because then I know I'm home. I know that we're going to have a great discussion. And we usually go out to tea afterwards and usually they pay for it. <laughs> and this is the lovely thing about Muslims, they love, especially from what the Indian subcontinent, they love to talk theology. And they love to talk about two things. What are the two things they like to talk about? What would you guess? The book and the man. They always want to take on this book. And they want to take on the man behind this book. Jesus Christ. To me, I, those are the two things I want to talk about. And I don't even have to dangle a carrot in front of their eyes. All I have to tell them is two things. And I always, whenever we get into, especially if I haven't seen them before, they're the first time I've ever seen them, I always say, I believe Jesus is God. I believe the Bible is the word of God. Do you have an opinion? And you might get six hours of opinion just on those two subjects, especially here in the West, especially here in Europe. Because they already have been trained up on how to confront those two areas. And that's why I encourage you, get to know some Muslims wherever you are. Find out where they are and just talk about Jesus and the Bible. Then you're going to have to talk about the Quran and Muhammad. At some point, you're gonna, that's going to come into your conversation because they will make claim after claim after claim. <coughs> and this is now where we're going to get in today's, today's talk. So that's the introduction, which took me, what, 15 minutes, sorry about that, to get into. How many have heard, seen this lecture before. I've done this lecture once before back in 2016. None of you. One. Two. Well, you've seen everything I've done, so <laughs> you don't count. In fact, I might have you come up here and do some of this. This is my other expert over here, so he's the other one, the other Islamicist in the room. What we're going to do then, I'm, I wasn't going to go through all introductory, but since none of you have seen this or don't where I'm going to go, we're going to do the whole introduction and, go and, and walk you through it so that you know where we're going. Now, we are going to go till 10.30, then we're going to have a half an hour break for coffee and uh, try to get, peel yourself off the floor. And then we're going to come back at 11 o'clock and go till 12.15. Am I correct? 12.15. Under orders of my friend from Scottsdale. Because she wants to then give you, I guess, a handout for after that. And we do need to get out of here and get our luggage so we don't get stranded here from getting our planes. So let's go ahead and at any time, if you have any questions, just raise your hand because we have lots of time to get through this. We're in no hurry and I really do want to engage. And I want you to come back at me 
try as best you can, especially, Emil, you put on your Muslim cap today, all right? Try to be a Muslim and try to listen to this from a Muslim perspective and try to hammer me any way you can because the more I can get hammered now, the better it's going to be for that film, but also it's better for the Muslims to see that we are able to engage like this as Christians. Uh, let me define terms. I am a polemicist. My PhD is in polemics. In fact, I think I'm the first in the world to get a PhD in Islamic polemics for one very good reason. Most people don't even know what the word means. <laughs> Secondly, there's no school in the world that teaches it. This doesn't exist. Am I correct? There's just no school that would, would dare teach this because they would be targeted by Muslims. Polemics, do you all know what the, is there someone who doesn't know what that word means? You all know what it means? Yeah? Great, so we can go right ahead. So I go on the offense. That's what I am. I'm very offensive. And I don't apologize for being offensive because this is exactly what I'm called to do. Don't you do this in the Arab speaking world in Pakistan. You can do this in India, but not in Bangladesh. All right, you can do it in Indonesia. I have, I have used this in Indonesia, I got, but I, we got in and we were able to teach. So I can teach it in these countries. Be careful about using it in Muslim countries. That's all I would say. And it's sad that I have to say that. Isn't it interesting? We don't, we don't do this with the Christian world. No, there's no Christian or any organization that would censor anybody criticizing the Bible or criticizing the emergence of Christianity or criticizing Jesus Christ. This just doesn't exist. It did, historically. We did have a historical period where that did happen, but not today. And certainly not in the New Testament period. And that's why it's fascinating that we're now coming full circle. We're doing what Paul did. And what I'm doing today is what Paul did when he was in Ephesus or uh, Berea, Cappadocia, Laodicea. Whenever he went into the synagogue and confronted the Jews with what they had done to the Messiah. That's what I do. I follow, he's my example and he's my paradigm. So what we're going to do today, be aware of the fact that this is more for Europe. This is for your locale. This kind of material you can use all over Europe and really all over the world, just not in the 1040 window. And I'm even saying that, be careful, because there are many places, there are many places you can use it in the 1040 window. I'll let each one of you decide in your own, uh, wherever you're going to move, or whatever country you're in, how it is effective or not. So let's start with this claim that Muslims make. So what do they claim? Well, they make the claim and for the last 1400 years they've made this claim. Now I am going to tell you, put your pencils down, you're not going to keep up with me. However, all of you can have this PowerPoint. At the, end of the, at the end of the session, just give me your USB drive and I'll slip it over to you and you can put it on your computers. So this is available to all of you. Not to those on the camera. I get this all the time. People all over the world, people, you said we could have this PowerPoint because I said it on camera. For people only in this room, you can have this PowerPoint, all right? Because I do not want to spend my whole life sending PowerPoints all over the world. <laughs> and remember, even what I say today, in another six months, it'll have changed. Because we're getting in so much new material all the time. That's the exciting thing about this material. It is new and it is exciting, and it's all going one direction, which is really helping us out. So let's go ahead and start with this claim. Whether they, Muslims are radicals, whether they are nominal, whether they are liberal, they would all make, well, maybe not the liberals. Let's hold off on the liberals. They may not make this claim, but anybody else would say that the Muhammad is the last and the greatest of all prophets. They would say that the Quran was his revelation sent down only to him and that it is the final and greatest revelation. So it supersedes anything that comes after it, or sorry, even before it. And therefore, Islam is the final religion based on Muhammad's life in sayings and the Quran's teachings. So that's the Book of the Man. The teachings of Muhammad would be the Sunnah, and that would include the Sirah, which is the Siratul Rasulullah, his biography, the Hadith, which would be his sayings, the Tafsir, which would be the, the commentaries on the Quran, and the Tahrik, which would be the history. So those are the four genres of the Islamic or the Sunnah of the Prophet, looking at his example to then apply what's in the Quran. So, Islam is completely dependent on one book and one man, the Book of the Man. So, we need to investigate both the Qur'an and Muhammad and see if indeed the Muslims are correct. We've already done the book two nights ago. And that, by the way, is up online. That what I did two nights ago is already up online on Fander Films. If you want to take a card, here's the thing on YouTube, Fander Films. Go up and look at it. I put it up about a month and a half ago. It was a talk that I did on the Qur'an in Hong Kong back in November where I was to debate a Muslim uh, and he never showed up. 
So what I did, uh, we decided to go ahead and put it and do it at the university there, the, the city university. The day before we were to do that talk at the city university, the Muslims in Hong Kong went to the authorities and said that I was a hate preacher and that I was an Islamophobe. Now the city university didn't even ask to talk to me about it. They just banned me from the university, just like that. This is the second year running where that has happened. The year before, in 2017, I was also in Hong Kong to go to another university to talk, a similar talk, and we had already started the talk like we're doing right now. We were half an hour into the talk when the authorities came and threw us all out, 200 of us. And we all had to walk down the hill to a church and continue it. But you know, you can ban us all you want. We still film everything we say. And that went up on, on my Fander Film site about a month and a half ago. Over 40,000 people have watched it now. And we're getting reports. And Muslims are now contacting me who have become Christians because of that talk. The same talk that you all heard, but you heard very encapsulated, very short form. That is now up. So you can get the one on the Quran uh, on Fander Films. That's up there now. Now this here is the next step. This is going now to Muhammad himself. This is going to the emergence of Islam and to these claims. One book modeled by one man. So what about the man? Well, let's see what Muslims have said. And this is what I called, this is the classical account. This is the only account you're going to hear on university campuses. This is the one you've grown up with. This is the one that every Muslim knows. And it starts from the premise that Muhammad was born in 570 in Mecca. Uh, that he received, uh, or he came upon an angel in the Hira cave. Now he would go up there and meditate, according to the classical account. I'm going to keep saying the classical account, okay? You'll see why. According to the classical account, based on Ibn Hisham and Ibn Ishaq. So anytime I say Ibn Hisham and Ibn Ishaq, hold on to that. You'll see why. In 610, then, when he was approached by this angel, well, he didn't know who it was, but, and the angel says, Akra, which means read or recite, and his response was, Ma'akra, I cannot recite, I cannot recite. The angel squeezed him, this happened three times, and finally the angel let him go, he fled back to Mecca, went to his wife, Khadija, his only wife at that time, told her what had happened, and so she did a quick test by having him sit on either leg, asking him the question, and then disrobing, knowing that if it was an angel, they would, the angel would not be in her presence while she was naked. And so when he still considered to say, still said, yes, this was what happened to me, she realized he was telling the truth, went to her cousin, Ibn, Waraka Ibn Nofal, to have him listen to this story. Waraka Ibn Nofal, according to the traditions, was a Nestorian Christian. Isn't that interesting? So her cousin is the one that listens to the story, turns to Muhammad, and says, truly, you are a prophet. This is a revelation coming to you. So it's a Nestorian Christian that gives Muhammad the authority as a prophet, one of the ironies of history. He then starts to receive these revelations, and he receives them uh, from 610 to 622 there in Mecca. He then, while he's receiving these revelations, he then recites them. He does not write these down. His companions there in Mecca would memorize what he was saying. So if you look at the Quran and you just uh, split it in half. Now this goes from right to left because it follows the Arabic. That would be Medina. This would be Mecca. So it's these surahs at the latter half, the second half of the Quran. There are some Medinan material here and there is some Meccan material here, but that's the Meccan. It's the second half of the Quran because they're the larger surahs. Sorry, the other way around. They're the smaller surahs. So these revelations were much more short-winded to begin with, and they got more and more long-winded as he moved to Medina. He moves to Medina in 622, but before he moves to Medina in 621, he is woken up in the middle of the night, and he's told to go up on the, the back of a winged horse who flies him up to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem he, elevate, he goes up to the seven heavens, gets up to the seventh heaven, and meets Allah up there, who tells him to pray 50 times a day. Comes down to the fifth heaven, meets Moses. Moses said, how many times did he ask you to pray? He says, 50. He says, ah, oh, that's way too many. Go back up and see if you can get it down. So he bounces back and forth between the 7th and the 5th heaven, bringing the prayers down from 50, 45 down to 10, 5 prayers. Once he gets it to 5 prayers, Moses says, fine, now you can go back down to earth. That's where we get the 5 prayers from. It's called the Miraj, and that happens there in 621 while he's in Mecca. Interesting. So the five prayers we, the all Muslims pray today, come from Moses. <laughs> and it's fascinating because you will not find five prayers in the Quran. 
you will only find three. Ironic, isn't it? Nonetheless, this happens in 621. 622 then, he is invited by the Ansar there in Medina to come up and arbitrate between the Ansar and the Jews. The Banu Kainuka family, the Banu Nadir family, the Banu Qurayza, these are the three Jewish tribes that were very wealthy and they were dominating the trade and the Ansar were having difficulties with them and that's why they use Muhammad as a neutral arbiter to come and do that arbitration. So he moves up in 622, it's known as the Hijra. Hijra means, as you know, it means exodus. So he has an exodus to Medina with around 80, some traditions say as many as 200 followers. So it was not very large. Not very many people at that time. 622 then, he starts receiving these, this part of the Quran, the first part, the Medinan material, much longer, much more violent. These are the problematic chapters, not these. 622 then, that begins, and then in between 622 and 633, then in 630, he then moves down to Mecca, takes over Mecca without firing a shot. So now he now controls all of the central part of Arabia, called the Hijaz, and then in 632 he suddenly dies, which tends to happen to all of us. Now, at his death, the Quran had not yet been written down. It was still on pieces of bark, stones, and on, in the memory of his companions. Abu Bakr takes over control, and he rules for two years, and at that time, he then is the first to write, have the Quran written down. He takes a man named Zaidi bin Thabit, who is his, the secretary of Muhammad, to uh, gives him that responsibility. So there's the first recension, the first copy, the first codex of the Quran written in 632 to 634. Abu Bakr dies, normal death. Umar takes over, and he's the one that starts to expand the borders and moves, starts moving right across North Africa in your direction, this way, and then goes this direction over towards the Sassanid area. The Sassanids, these are the Persians. Now, he then is killed in 646, and Uthman takes over. So he's the third caliph. Caliph would be like a king. So from 646 to 656, Uthman is in power, and then he takes that copy that was made by Zaidi bin Thabit, and that had been hidden under the bed of Hafsa, one of the wives of Muhammad, he takes that copy of hers and has Zaidi bin Thabit redo that Quran again, recopy it, and to do it in the Qureshi dialect. That happens in around 652. And then from that one copy, they make nine copies, send it to nine different provinces, and then he is killed in 646, and the cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, Ali, then takes over as the fourth caliph. And he only survives five years on the, in 651, then he is killed at the battle, battle of Sifin by Mu'awiyah. So here you have, you have the four caliphs, you have Muhammad's life and you have the four caliphs, and I'm uh, sorry, did I say 651, 661, because he takes over in 656 to 661. So that's the story, the classical account. Have any of you heard any different? Now, you may have heard many other things. I'm just giving you the bare skeleton, okay? Is there any reason to doubt that? Everything I've told you, where does it come from? I helped you out about five minutes ago. I gave the names of where this comes from. Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Isham, Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Al-Tabari. Have you heard these names before? If you were a Muslim and those who are listening, you would know these names immediately. And you would know that this is the only source for everything I've just told you. There's no other source. What are these names? Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, Sahih Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Al-Tabari. From uh, 9th century. Good man. You do remember. Hey, give him a combination. Take a look and see where this material. So everything we've talked about is right here in this period, right? There's the... 570 to 632 and then on up to 656 uh, around around this area so all this that we're talking about is where that red line is now hopefully you would assume that everything that we're talking about was written by people who live then right should be right but they don't the first time we hear anything about about muhammad's life is from ibn ishaq 
right here. Look when he died, 765. But we don't have any of Ibn Ishaq's material. Everything we know about Muhammad, how Islam began, was actually written down by this guy right here, Ibn Hisham. Look when he died, 833. Muhammad died in 632. How many years? 200 years. So the first time we hear anything written down about Muhammad's life, anything we've written about, about how Islam began, about Medina, about Mecca, about this story, about him going up to the seven heavens, all these great stories is first written down 200 years after the fact. Ibn Hisham didn't even live in that part of the world. He lived far to the west and hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away. He gets it from Ibn Ishaq, but as he says himself, much of what Ibn Ishaq said he did not trust, so he threw it out and only retained that which he trusts. So we have no idea whether or not even the material from Ibn Ishaq is in his writing. So therefore, everything we know about Muhammad begins to be written down in 833. What about the sayings of Muhammad, which are even more prolific? We're told by the Islamic scholars that a man named Al-Buhari was given 600,000 of these sayings of Muhammad. They're called Akhbars. And he took those 600,000 and then he whittled them down, threw out 98% of them and only retained 7,397. So basically 7,400 of the 600,000. He only retained 2% of it and threw all the rest away. He dies in 870. So that's 240 years later that you get the first sayings of Muhammad written down in a codified form. We don't even have al-Buhari's original text. The earliest text we have for al-Buhari is not till the 11th century. When you get all set nine volumes, the nine volumes of al-Buhari not, do not appear until the 17th century. Ooh, two, 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 two. <laughs> are you seeing what I'm saying? Now, the others that write down the hadith, men like Sahih Muslim Ibn Dawud, they all write after 870. So you're talking about 240 and later that you finally get these references to what Muhammad said. But these people don't even come from Arabia. Bukhari comes from Buhara, which is up north of Iran today. Hundreds of miles away, hundreds of years later, they had never met Muhammad, yet they suddenly know what Muhammad said. So everything that we're dependent on for our Muslims are dependent on for the classical account comes from not 765 but from 833 and later. Now let's look at Christianity. Let's look at the biography of Jesus and look at the sayings of Jesus. The biography of Jesus would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the black letter part of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The sayings of Jesus, the hadith of Jesus would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the red letter part. Wherever it's red letters. So you have red letters wherever Jesus speaks, that's the hadith of Jesus. The tafsir, ah, I didn't talk about the tafsir. The tafsir of, of the com commentaries don't begin to appear until 923. That's the 10th century. That's 300 years later. He is the first to write down any tafsir, and he's also the first, al Tabari is the first to write down any tahriq, which would be the histories of all mankind, 10th century. So everything we know about Jesus, what he said and did, was written, well, the first three Gospels were written within 40 years of Christ's death, by 60 AD, 70 AD, and then you have John, that would have been written about 90 AD. So within 60 years of Christ's death, you have the Hadith of Jesus and the Siddha of Jesus. Am I correct? 60 years. Written by those who actually knew him, John. And Matthew were right there. They were with Jesus for the last three years. They saw what he did. They heard what he said. So they were eyewitnesses. The other two, Mark and Luke, got it from the eyewitnesses who were with Jesus. So here you have the tafsir and the tikh, and, and then the tafsir. The tafsir of Jesus would be the commentaries that explain what he did would be Paul's letters. The gospel of Jesus applied in Philippi. The gospel of Jesus applied in Corinth. In, Cor in Ephesus. These are the letters. So that's the commentary that would be equivalent to the tafsir of Muhammad. These would be the tafsir of Jesus. They were written within 15 to at least 65 because they are 62 when Paul was then finally killed in Rome. So all of them would have been written within 30 years of Christ's death. Am I correct on that? Though he was not an eyewitness to Jesus himself, he was the one that took and then applied it to each one of those cities. And the Tahrit would be the book of Acts. There's the equivalent, the book of Acts, which is this history of the early church. That would have been written by Luke. It had been written between six, uh, six, I'm sorry, 52 AD and 62 AD within that 10 year period. So you then you understand that within 30 years you get the Tahrik. So all four genres are written within 50 to 60 years of Christ's death. 
All four genres for Muhammad would be written two to three hundred years for Muhammad's death. Which is more authoritative? And yet no one's asked this question. I remember hearing this in 1994 when I was studying there at School of Orange and African Studies under Dr. Gerald Hunting, and I heard these late dates, and I said, wait a minute, I raised my hands, and I said, this is hugely problematic. He says, yes, but we're not going to talk about that, because there were 25 Muslims in the class. And he was the first one to introduce me what I'm going to be doing next, but it was fascinating that he did not want to come to any conclusions because he was fearful of what the Muslims would say. In London, the premier school in London on historical... Uh, the, histor the history of Islam. So, 21st century scholars are deeply troubled by this, these late dates. And so they're saying this, Islam as we know it did not exist in the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to three hundred years. The Quran probably was not revealed to one man in 22 years, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. Their conclusion is that the history of early Islam, at least from the time of the Caliph Abdul Malik and before, is a later fabrication. Now, that's a huge bit to say. How am I going to prove it? I'm not going to prove it. I'm going to let them prove it. We're going to use their material. So, let's look at their concerns. This is their pr primary concerns. Why is it it took so long to write this down? Why did it take 200 years to write down what Muhammad said and did? Ah, 240 years in some case. Were the people not literate? Remember, they controlled by 6, 685. This is by the time Abdul Malik comes to power and creates, and we're going to see, remember that name. We're going to talk a lot about that name this morning, Abdul Malik. He is the great caliph from 685 to 705 who then introduces the Arab, the whole Arab identity. But nonetheless, up until his time, they, they controlled Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo by 642, and then from Spain to India by 685. Spain to India, that whole swath of land from Spain to India was under the control and still is under the control except for Spain and Jerusalem, Israel. All the rest of that land is still under their control 1400 years later. So there's no reason not to have written this down. Plus, people could read and write, could they not in those countries? Certainly they could. We know there was a library in Alexandria in the 5th century that was burned to the ground. So people could read and write. Muslims tell us that they could read and write. They are the ones that tell us that this was written down in 632 by Zaid ibn Thabit. If you're writing down, that means you're putting together a book, right? It's their claim. So. You cannot excuse it by saying no one could read and write that early. It doesn't work anymore. More than that, where did the 9th century biographers get their material from? Well, if you look at every one of the akhbars, there's a matan that, in, uh, that precedes it. And that would be the names, the isnad. The isnad would be the names of those from which that this material got it from. So I got it from so and so, who got it from so and so, who got it from so and so, who got it from a companion of the Prophet. And in every case of all of these akbaras, they have these isnads that are derived there. Now, what does that tell you? What is this all based on? Oral tradition. Everything we know about Muhammad, everything we know about Islam, everything we know about the emergence of Islam, everything we know about how the Quran was put together, all comes from oral tradition. I have a problem with oral tradition because I know what will happen. If I told you something in your ear and you tell her and he comes on down here, by the time it gets to him, what I tell you and what I tell him are two different things. You, pay the, you probably play that in birthday parties. We call it Chinese whispers. Sorry if there's any Chinese here. But or telephone. It's a great thing to play, but within a 15 minute period, if you can get a whole different story, can you imagine what happens over 200 years? And so you can see that this is problematic. This is enormously problematic. If this, everything that Muslims are dependent on, everything they know about how Islam began, who their prophet was, and also how the Quran was written, is all based on oral tradition. Can it be trusted? Absolutely not. And that's why where the historians are very concerned. And what they're saying is, why not, if we cannot trust it, why don't we go back to the 7th century? Let's go back to the 7th century. Let's go to this time period when the world looked like this. And this is by 661. So we're talking about 661. They already controlled this part of the world. They moved into that part. And so from, from Andalusia, which is Spain, the name for Spain today, it's called Andalusia then, all the way over to the Mughal Empire, which is now India today, that whole swath of land was under their control very literate and very 
uh, certainly would have had no excuse whatsoever to have written this down. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at these scholars here. These are the scholars I get my material from. Dr. John Wansborough, who is head of department at School of Oriental African Studies. He came out with two books called Chronic Studies and Sectarian Milieu in the 1970s that blew open this whole criticism. And so he's, he's, I'm going to be using him. Dr. Gerald Haunting was my teacher in 1994 when I studied there at School of Oriental SOAS. And he looks at the first century of Islam and is the, probably the best one that I've come across that unpacks that material for us. Dr. Patricia Corona uh, was a, I knew her. Uh, she, when I started my doctorate, she was the, uh, she was my first, one of my first supervisors. Uh, she was at, at uh, uh, Cambridge at that time. She reads and writes 15 languages all archaic languages. So you can see the scholarship that we're uh, talking about. I, I don't think anybody's been able to equal her. She just passed away about a year and a half ago. Uh, she got death threats for writing a book on Meccan trade. I'll be using her material on Mecca that we're going to come to. And she had a move from Oxford University to Cambridge University. That's when I knew her. My first debate in 1995, I went to her office and she was the one that actually walked me through all this newest material. And it was her material that I used in uh, that debate. I gave 10 historical questions to Dr. General Badawi in 1995, August of 1995. That was my first debate on this material. We're in 2019. This is 24 years later. And yet, General Badawi, or in, none of them have been able to answer those 10 questions. All of them came from Dr. Patricia Kroner. Now, that was, we put that up on in the internet. It's still up there. And you'll see why, because some of those I'm going to introduce in this talk. So this is nothing new for me. This has been around for 24 years, 25 years, moving on to 25 years. Dr. Andrew Rippon out of Calgary, he is probably the one that has brought these difficult ideas and put it down to layman's terminology. Now he just passed away as well. Dr. Robert Hoyland out of Oxford, he's no longer there. I think he's up in Edinburgh. I'm not sure where he's at right now, but when he wrote his book on seeing Islam as others saw it, he reads and writes 18 languages. So these scholars are really linguists. They go back to the original language and they read them in the original language and they usually don't translate them for the rest of us because they don't want Muslims to read this, which is tragic because they're up in the scholastic world. They're in the academia world and they do not want this to get down to the streets. When I was studying with Dr. Gerald Haunting, I would take what he was saying in class, and after two weeks, every Muslim in that class left the class. Only, I say not every, two remained. This is in 1994 when we were getting the, hearing this material. And it's the first time I'd ever heard this material. I had a master's in Islam, and I'd never come across this material because they were not teaching this in America yet. This was only being taught in Britain and Germany. Those are the only two places they were teaching this new material. And I remember as the Muslims left, they slammed the door, yelling, Allahu Akbar, as they slammed. The reason why is they could not come up with any rebuttals. They had no idea how to handle this kind of material. And that's why Gerald Haunting was going very soft. He didn't want to come to any conclusion. He just put it out there. Well, I was going to Speaker's Corner at that time, and I just started to try it out at Speaker's Corner. And I got filmed there. They didn't have uh, you know, these smartphones back then, but they did have cameras. And it was put into a video cassette, and they were selling it in the bookstores there in London. And one of the students saw this VHS. Remember the old VHSs? Brought it to Dr. Hawting and showed him. And one of your students is getting up and actually introducing what you're teaching down at Speaker's Corner. He called me to his office, and he gave me a lecture. He says, don't you ever do this. I said, sir, if you're putting it out there, I've got to use it. If you're refusing to use it, I've got to do it. Don't stop me. Muslims need to hear this. It's no good for you just teaching teaching it in a class and keeping it cou cou couched and keeping it private. This is devastating for Islam. This is going to destroy. And I said it to the side, this is the Achilles heels of Islam right here. And here you are keeping it to yourself, keeping it in academia, where it doesn't belong. Thank God that you're doing the research, but let us, if you're not going to do it, don't stop me from doing it. Let me get it out there. 1995, I was introducing it. I was, uh, back in the 1990s, the, the, the speaker's corner was very violent. This is before Muslims became peaceful. And there was no narrative of peace back in the 1990s. That only came after 9-11, where the narrative suddenly changed overnight. But back then, we would, they would have all these speakers on different ladders. And there was about 10 speakers down there, and all around there would be their talibis, their disciples, from the Jamaat Islami, the Tabikli Jamaat. And I would go into each group, and I would try to confront the speakers. And I remember introducing Dr. Gerald Hunting's material and one day in 1995, 
the guy who was up on the ladder, who was a convert, a Trinidadian convert to Islam. I can't remember his name anymore, but he got off the ladder and he, was, he had been a professional boxer. And he just slammed me and I went flying and I went out. I went, went unconscious. I don't know what happened after that. What I was told is about 60 Muslims came and started kicking me on the ground. And uh, then a, a big black man came and laid on top of me and took all the blows. That's what I was told. The police finally got and were able to pull me out and it was in the news the next day and I asked the police, where's this black man? I'd like to thank him. He says, he's disappeared. Had no idea who he was. A number of years ago, I was at Speaker's Corner and um, I was on a ladder and this time, it was back there in, in 1995, the police were so concerned because they said, listen, next time you're gonna die. There's no way we can protect you. You've got to get on a ladder so we can see you at all times. And I said, okay, I've never been on a ladder before and I'm not really good at homiletics and I don't know how to, yeah, I couldn't string a lot of words together. I wasn't really uh, as clever as I am now because Speaker's Corner trained me to do what I'm doing now. And I, see, I, I said, you've got to get on a ladder at least for your own protection. So I said, okay, I'll get on a ladder and I've been on a ladder ever since. I'll be on a ladder this Sunday. But in a, I was in the middle of a debate. I had done about four debates. What was happening by, the, by 2010, 11, 12, I can't remember if it was 2012. I would talk to the camera and I would tell Muslims, listen, I'm here every Sunday. If you have any problem with what I'm saying, come and see me. Come and, and debate me. And I always keep a second ladder for that reason. Uh, and they would come, uh, these guys would come from all over the world. They would come and we would have these half an hour debates. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, back and forth, five minutes. And it was so much fun because you really engage with them very quickly and you don't know what the subject is, but you don't have any computer, you have no books in your hand, you have nothing, you just have to have it all in your head. And that's a great way to learn how to engage like that because if you can do it at Speaker's Corner, you can do it at tea shops, anywhere in the world. And it's a great way to train us. And after this one day, day, I had debated maybe four different Muslims, about half an hour each, I had got off the ladder and suddenly I start getting beat up. I just start there punching me, these young, they're, I think they look, they look like they were Middle Easterners because they had never heard this kind of criticism before. And you can understand if you're hearing this kind of criticism, how damaging it can be for the Muslims. And suddenly a big black man came and put his arms around me, he said, let's go Jay. And he took the blows for me. When I turned around to thank him, he had disappeared. So I call him Barry, my black angel. I was told by the Muslims that there are two angels above the branches who sit there and they could see them. A fellow Mubin guy in 9, 2010 came from Canada and he saw these angels on the branches above me and he was scared to death. We went and had dinner afterwards and he told me about it. And he had no idea what those two people were, why those two guys were up in the, why they were up in the, in the branches. And I said, well, d sh tell me, what did you see? Because I've never seen them. In the 25 years though, I've never seen any, anybody in branches above me, these big oak trees that we stand under. <laughs> there at Hyde Park. And he says, well, there were two men sitting on a branch looking at you and smiling at you. You must have seen them, Jay. They scared me. You must have seen them. I said, no, but I know what you saw. And I said, every day I get up on the ladder, there are churches in America, 20 churches or so. I get up on the ladder at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They're there at 11 o'clock in the morning, so five hours difference. They're starting to pray that I preach the gospel. They're starting to pray that Muslims hear it. They're starting to pray for my protection. You saw the answer to their prayers. Those were angels. I have never seen them. And I know that Christians see angels everywhere, but Muslims are not used to this. You have no idea of the index. That's why God wanted you to see them so that when you told me you saw these two men, I could tr trust you before I could trust any Christians on this. So I call them Harry and Barry. Harry and Larry. Those Harry and Larry on the branches and Barry on the ground. But this is the kind of stuff that when you unpack it, you're going to have to, you're going to have to use this kind of protection. When Haunting heard that I was doing this, I said to him, you keep doing the research. I'm not asking you to go public with this. However, anything you publish, I can quote. So be careful what you publish. But please do publish it because we want to quote them. And I said, this is, I understand this is not your battle. You're nothing more than an academic. You don't have any, anything really, there's nothing that you're in, uh, that, th there's no reason why you would want this to go to the Muslims because you don't have a better answer. You have nothing to give them. I do. And the question is, what do we do when we, if we're going to talk about oral tradition or we're going to talk about historical um, authenticity and credibility, should we not apply that to every faith, including the Jehovah Witnesses, including the Mormons, and especially the Mormons? Because I understand, and I'm not an expert on Mormonism like you are, but uh, when you look and ask the same question, historical critique on uh, Mormonism, it destroys Mormonism, especially with the glasses of Joseph Smith. That's Can you see then why if this, this exercise that we're doing today must be done to every book? 
it must be done to the Book of Mormon, it must be done to the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas. All the Hindu scriptures have to also pass the same historical test that so far only the Bible has. So getting to your second question, there's the segue right into the second question. I don't want to leave them hanging. I don't want atheists to take this material and use it because they have nothing to replace it with. I want to make sure that when Muslims hear the, the criticism that we're going to give, the historical criticism that we're going to give on, their emerge, on the emergence of what they believe has always been authentic, I don't want to send, therefore destroy that faith because God bless them. They have a faith in God. They already believe in heaven and hell. They already believe in the prophetic line. They already believe that there is a, that there is a beginning in it. And, and more than that, they also believe that there is a problem with sin. So already we see have some commonalities. I just want to bring them home. And I want to bring them home to another book that has passed every one of the tests we're asking of the Quran. I also want to bring him to, home to another man that's also passed this historical test that we're now applying to Muhammad. So, for heaven's sakes, don't destroy that. But I also want to say the same thing to all, all of our uh, Jehovah Witnesses and certainly our Mormon brothers and sisters. They need to ask the question we're asking today of the Book of Mormon. And they're going to find that there are holes, enormous holes, historical holes with the Book of Mormon. Therefore, don't give up God. Just come on home. Just come on home. And I say that to my Muslim friends. Come on home. Because the, their, their faith in God is beautiful. And the fact that they have such a strong faith in God, I'm jealous of that, that faith. But I, they've got the wrong God. They've got the wrong history. They've got the wrong prophet. They've got the wrong book. So let's move on. Let's go ahead and look at these characters. Well, they're not characters. They're quite well-known individuals. Hoyland, as I said, from Oxford, Yehuda Nebo, uh, the... Um, Cross, uh, he uh, was at the University of Jerusalem. He is the one that actually went and looked at the earliest inscriptions and noticed all these inscriptions had no shahada on them, no reference to people called Muslims, no reference to a religion called Islam. Yet these are inscriptions from the mid 7th century moving right up to the late part of the 7th century. Muhammad died in 632 in the beginning of the 7th century. So he's done an amazing work looking at the earliest Arab inscriptions, and that's why I purposely say Arab, not Muslim. And then you have the German school, Luling, Quinn, von Bothmer, Oleg. These are the ones who are by far the best in the world on the earliest Islamic or chronic manuscripts. And we're not going to talk more about them today, but the others we will. But there have been three books that have come out. Uh, one of them is right here, uh, In the Shadow of the Sword by Tom Holland in 2012. So it's been out seven years. If you don't have it, get it. Because he took the, this very academic material and brought it down to layman's terminology so that you can use it. Uh, you can get it on uh, Amazon. It's it's large, thick book. So be careful. Read the first 100 pages, then jump to the last 100 pages, and then you get everything that's essential. Anything in between is, is good, but it's not dealing with the historical critique. And then he did a documentary that tried to encapsulate what he was saying in his book in 2012 in August 28 called Islam, the Untold Story. That was shown on Channel 4 television. And just, it's only 90 minutes long. And if any of you want it, I have it right here on my computer. I can give it to you before you leave today. What's fascinating, that he was very careful not to come to any conclusions. He just put the material out there. And then you would have a, a, a scholar, a Muslim scholar, I think from Georgetown University, who st stood next to him and asked him for his response, much like the question you just asked. And he's a scholar. And his response was, who cares? Basically, that's what he said. I don't really care because I realize that we have 1.6 billion. And on camera, he would have to say that. And that's what they'll say at Speaker's Corner this Sunday. Who cares? What's happening is the people who are watching the film care. They have to save face, and this is called what we call the, 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 the private versus the public face. I don't really want them to say anything. I want them to go home and then deal with it. I want them in private to ask, now what are you going to do when everything you know is, has been destroyed from underneath you? Your foundations have been thrown out. So they tried to show this film a second time in November. The Muslims ref uh, wrote in. They, ref had, they refused to let it be shown, and so it's never been shown a second time. The censorship is so strong in Britain now for anything that's against Islam. Then you have Dan Gibson. Now, Dan Gibson is an archaeologist archaeologist. He has 
rather than write, read books, although he has read books his whole life, he grew up in a family that were archaeologists. His grandfather was an archaeologist. His father was an archaeologist. Um, they all lived in the Middle East, so he grew up in the Middle East. He spooks, fl speaks fluent Arabic, and he went in 1979 and started, uh, did research on the, the um, geographical areas that are in the Quran and also on the Qiblas, especially the Qiblas, that means the direction of prayer. And I'm going to use an awful lot of his material because he has come out with, he has probably been the most prolific in this area. So from 1979 to 2004, for 25 years, he lived in Morocco, he lived in Jordan, he lived in Yemen, and he just spent his time amongst the Bedouin. And he is the first one to actually go to every one of these locations physically go to every one of them and then take coordinate, uh, get his coordinates in situ. He didn't stay in London or uh, in uh, a large city away from that place. He actually went to each one of these locations to find out how to answer these questions. So what are they finding? I'm going to give you the conclusions before I even support those conclusions. What they have found is that the first Arab inscription referencing Muhammad is in 691. Hold on a minute, he died in 632. Do you see how problematic that is? The first Arab, I'm not using the word Muslim, I'm saying Arab inscription. We don't see any reference to Muhammad in any Arab text prior to 691. That's 60 years too late. The first reference to Muslims is in the 690s. Around the same time that Muhammad is introduced, so is the word Muslim introduced. Yet Muslims were supposed to have been around since 624. Muhammad was the first, was the Muslim that actually introduced it. So what did these Arabs call themselves? Well, they call themselves Sadasans. That's the name, name for an Arab. They call themselves Hagarines because they came in the line of Hagar. They call themselves Ishmaelites, the son of Hagar. So they were Ishmaelites. They call themselves Maghreb because they're from the Maghreb. And they call themselves Mahajurun. These are the names they give themselves. When you look at their documentation, they refer to themselves in these five names. Mahajurun are people of the Hijab, people of the Exodus. Could also be referred to uh, being nomadic. The first reference to the word Islam is not till 691. That's first recorded on the Dome of the Rock there in Jerusalem, built in 691 by Abd al-Malik. That's why Abd al-Malik is so important. And then the first reference to Mecca, watch this. The first reference to Mecca is not till 741. Ooh, two, 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 two. That's the huge one. That's the one that is disturbing everybody. You'll see why as we get to it. The first biography of Muhammad, as I've already said, does not even appear until 833. So let's go right into it. Let's look at geography. Now, Dan Gibson, when he looked through this book here, and of course he scoured it, he noticed that there are about 65 references to geographical locations. Only nine places are named. What was, over, what was overwhelming were the number of, of references to these people that had contact with this prophet. But it doesn't name the prophet. In the Quran, you will only find Muhammad's name four times. Did you know that? I'll give you the references right here. These are the only places you'll find his name. Chapter 3, verse 144. Chapter 33, verse 40. Chapter 47, verse 2. And chapter 48, verse 29. That's it. All the way through the Quran, it refers to this prophet. It refers to the place of the prophet, but it doesn't give a name. There's only one place where Mecca is referenced, and that's in chapter 48, verse 24. That's it. <coughs> so this man, this prophet, who lives in the place of the prophet, or the settlement of the prophet, but is given no name, suggests that there's a problem here with that name. Ooh, I love this. Can you then understand that we're already, we're starting to see that there is some, there, it looks like that this name was then added at a later date. Nonetheless, what we do know is that this prophet 24 times has contact with people from Thamud, which are the Nabataeans. 23 times has contact with people from Ud or Ad, which we now know is the biblical Uds. And seven times has contact with people from Midian, who are the Midianites. The difficulty is, look and see where the people from Ad, Thamud, and Midian are. They live way up here, 600 miles further north. He's down here in Mecca. How did he have contact with these people over and over again, day after day, unless he had a helicopter to tra travel 1,200 miles? Do you see the difficulty? That immediately shows you that there's a difficulty with the Quran itself. So let's then do a comparison. In the Quran, there are 65 geographical references. Nine places are named. 600 miles too far north. 
every one of the places in the wrong place. Just look at the Gospel of Luke as a comparison, which is much, much older. It's 600 years older, 700 years older than the Quran. 110 geographical references, 31 places named, every one of them in the right place. No one disputes the Gospel of Luke or the book of Acts. That's the beauty of the Bible. So like with like, you can see enormous disparity just between something as simple as geographical locations in two different books. So let's now go to the second problem, Mecca. And this is the biggie. What are you going to do with Mecca? Well, it's only referred to in chapter 48, verse 24. That's the only place you will find. And all it says is, And he it is who hath withheld men's hand from you, and hath withheld your hands from them, in the valley of Mecca. So we do know it's in a valley. <clears throat> After he had made your victors over them, Allah is here of what ye do. So that's it. That's all you're going to get from the Quran on Mecca. It's in a valley. We need to know an awful lot more. Now, according to not only the Quran, according to the traditions, there's an awful lot that Muslims impose on Mecca, though it doesn't say Mecca, it just says the place of the Prophet, the Prophet, whoever this Prophet is. But according to the Quran, it's the first sanctuary according to mankind is Baqa, which could be Mecca. It is the mother of all settlements, according to chapter 6, verse 92, and chapter 42, verse 7. But it doesn't refer to Mecca, it just says again, over and over again, the place of the Prophet. It is where Adam and Eve supposedly were li lived. Uh, it was where Eve was thrown down to, according to the traditions. In chapter 7, verse 24, they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden, which is up in space. See, their Garden of Eden is in space. Ours is on earth. Two completely different Garden of Edens. Thrown down to earth, and Eve was sent down to, uh, to the place of the prophet, which Muslims claim is Mecca. Adam was sent over to India, southern India, and he walks across. He just strides across and gets to Mecca. The guy must have been huge. But nonetheless... There you can see uh, the reference to Mecca. So that would suggest that this place called Mecca was the first settlement for all of mankind. I'm guessing, because I don't think there's anybody before Adam and Eve. Am I correct? In chapter 21, verse 51 to 71, it talks about Abraham. It doesn't say Mecca, but he is in the place of the prophet, and he built, rebuilt the Kaaba with Ishmael. What is Abraham doing way down in Mecca, 600 miles too far south? He was up, supposed to be in Mesopotamia and in Canaan way up in the north. But nonetheless, in chapter 21, he's there in the Kaaba, and he rebuilds, he destroys the images, the idols in the Kaaba, and then he's thrown into a fiery pit, which seems to come from the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then according to the traditions, Muhammad, now the traditions are written in the ninth century, now they're referring to Mecca, but these are the traditions, not the Quran. According to the traditions, he then was born in Mecca, lived there till 622, so from 570 to 622, um, about 50, 50 years, and that he then canonized the Qibla towards Mecca, according to chapter 2, verse 149 in the Quran itself. Yet the only reference to Mecca, as I said earlier, is in chapter 48, verse 24. And as I say, none of these verses reference the name Mecca. It's been imposed on it, and whenever you see it in the Quran, they always put it in parentheses, because it's not there in the Arabic. Important, whenever you see parentheses in the Quran, that's commentary. Okay? That's not the Quran. That's not the text. So, what we do know from the traditions is that this place where the Prophet lived, that it was in a valley, in a parallel valley, according to Ibn Ishaq. It had a stream going through it, according to Al-Buhari. It was outside the ruins where the pillar of salt, where supposedly Lot's wife was... Uh, made into a pillar of salt. It had fields, according to Al-Buhari. It had trees, according to Sahih Al-Tirmidhi. It had grass, according to Al-Buhari. It had fruit, according to Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari, Al-Tabari talks about it has clay and loam. And both, uh, the, according to the surahs, it had olive trees with mountains overlooking it, according to Ibn Ishaq. Now stop and think. This is a very fertile place. Am I correct? It has streams. It has a valley. It has clay, loam, trees. It has olive trees. Can you see the problem right there? There are no olive trees outside of the Mediterranean world. Nowhere. You only have olive trees in the Mediterranean world. You do not have any olive trees in anywhere in Arabia. So you can see immediately when you look at this, this is not Mecca. Why haven't Muslims talked about this before? Why have no historians mentioned this before? Well, Dan Gibson saw this and he said, this doesn't make sense. None of this makes sense. He started the whole problem of Mecca. The difficulty is when you look at maps, this is just a modern day map looking back at the 7th century. Look what all the trade routes are in the green lines. And notice Mecca should be right here. That should be where Mecca is. Notice they don't go through Mecca. 
So let's, here's another map of the trade routes. And notice they all go through, come, they come down through here, Petra. So these ones are coming down there. Notice this one here, that's important as well, the, the one that comes along the waterway. So here's a map. This is a map from the sixth century. That's where Mecca should be. It's not there. Here's another one. Mecca should be right there. It's from the seventh century. Mecca doesn't appear on that map. Here's another one from the seventh century. Mecca still missing. A seventh century map, Mecca should be right around there, non-existent. Every one of the maps that we're getting from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh century do not have Mecca on them. It doesn't exist. So that's curious. Now let's look at this map. This is a modern map looking back, redacting back to what scholars believe existed back in the seventh century. And this is the map that Dr. Patricia Corona looked at and she saw problems immediately. Now, Montgomery Watt, the famous Islamicist, Scottish Presbyterian, who is well known for creating what we know as the trade route theory, suggested that the trade coming from China and India over here could not come this way because of the, of the Hindu Kush and the Himalaya Mountains. So that stopped the trade from going this direction. So they had to come this direction. And they came to the western coast of India, Gujarat and all the coastal areas. And they went across the Arabian Sea up through the Persian Gulf, disembarked there, and then they took their goods over here to the Mediterranean world. So all the trade needed to get to the Mediterranean world, they came this route. That was where trade went. Until the fifth century AD, when you had the Byzantines up here, were warring against the Sassanids, who were the Persians over here. So you had these two great empires warring against each other, which shut down all the trade going from the Persian Gulf. Had to be redirected, therefore, down here to Aden. Down here. See Aden there at the, at the tip of the Arabian Peninsula? They would then take off their goods here in Aden and then transship across along this green line here, all the way up 1,200 miles up to Gaza in the north. So it'd go from Aden to Sana to Najran to Taif, Chai, uh, Yathrib, Khaybar, Tabuk, and then on up to Gaza. And what's interesting, when Patricia Crone looked at this map, she said, hold on a minute, there are two problems. First and foremost, you can see the western plateau here. Here's where the trade route goes, along the western plateau. But look where Mecca is. It's not on the plateau. It's down off the plateau. You can see there's kind of a, there's a detour from Taif to come down to Mecca, then to get back up to Yathrib up there. Yathrib is the archaic name for what is now known as Medina. What's more, she said, look at Mecca. It's not only on the western plateau, it's down off the western plateau, on top of which, she said, it has no water. How could it have been a caravan uh, stop off place since it had no water to accommodate any caravans. It was not an oasis. It only has one well called the Zumzum well and other than that it was arid. It had no vegetation. That was the first problem. Secondly, take a look at that map again and this trade route theory that Montgomery Watt introduced suggesting all the uh, materials and goods coming from the east were offloaded here in Aden. What's wrong with that theory? Now my 10 year old son saw the problem immediately. Let's see if you're as clever as my 10-year-old son. Why did they stop further uh, west? You got there or go through the Red Sea? Why didn't it go through, oh, up the Red Sea? Yeah. Exactly. If you're on ship already, why don't you continue on ship? Why do you take it off and go on land? Patricia Krohn found that if you go 50 miles by land, just that distance, it would be the same expense as going 1,250 miles by sea. That's why we ship goods all over the world today by boat. It's the cheapest way to send large amounts of goods. Even today, these huge containing ships, because you don't need any caravans, you don't need any camels, you don't have to feed camels, you don't have to protect them, you don't have to have oasis to, fall, to be able to water them, you don't have to, you don't have, to have any type of uh, armaments, you basically just stay on board ship. It would make no sense to take off all the goods here in Aden and go 1,200 miles, 50 miles by land. So, but she went one step further. Back in the 1980s, she went and she went to all the trading documents 
from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, up until the seventh century. Now, remember, she reads and writes 15 languages, so she can read all the documents in their original text. She wanted to find out if they knew of a place called Mecca. She wanted to find out if there was any trade that went overland. And what she found is the 15 spices that uh, the traditions say existed in Mecca, not one of them existed in Mecca. They all existed over here in India and in China and also here in Africa. Only two spices came from the Arabian subcontinent and they were down here in what they call the Hadramat area, what is Yemen and Oman today. None of them were up here in Mecca area, in the Hijaz. There were no spices up there because it was too arid for spices. On top of which, all the trade from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th century was controlled by this place right here, Agilus, which is in Eritrea today. It was the Agilusians, the Eritreans, who controlled all the trade. They were the ones that plied the boats. Their names are found over here in India. There were no Arab names found over here in India in the trading documents. And the reason was very simple. The Arabs didn't really, weren't really seafaring people. They were mostly camel herders. They plied the deserts. Their caravans were in the deserts. And the only trade that they were interested in was leather and milk. No spices. So all these traditions were fallacious. But most problematic was she could not find any reference to Mecca in any of their documents. Oh, she found references to Taif, just over here. She found references here in Stesiphon, which is now Baghdad. They sent down, they found up here in Yathrib, they found some silver, and they opened up silver mines in Yathrib, and they had silver just north of Mecca, today's Mecca. They have found silver mines there. She found lots of references to Yathrib and to Taif and to Najran and to Tabuk and to Khaiba. No reference to a place called Mecca at all. Can you see how this is rather disturbing? Now, she got a death threat for writing that book and so she had to move to Cambridge University. But that book is still out there. You can go read it today. It's up online. Go pull it down and read it. And you can see this destroyed the trade route theory of Montgomery Watt and destroyed what everybody has assumed. And she said, even if they had plied in these spices of myrrh, uh, myrrh and frankincense, which was used here in the Hadramat, you're way up here. How could these people control the trade that was down here? Why would they let these people hundreds of miles away control that trade? And where was there any evidence of any of that trade? So. The first place that she could find any reference to the city of Mecca was the Neapocalypse of Pseudomethodius Continuato Byzantia Arabica. That's it. That's the first document anywhere. She came out with this in 1987. We're now in 2019. Nobody can find an earlier document. 741, Muhammad died in 632. Supposedly, Mecca existed at the time of Adam and Eve. Mecca was where Abraham went to in 1900 BC. Mecca was the center of trade, north, south, east, and west, according to all the Islamic traditions from the 9th century, yet the first reference to the city is not till 741, the mid 8th century. It was not on any map until 900 AD. No map included it. If it was such an important city, the oldest city in the history of mankind, if it was the center of this enormous kingdom, if it had everything to do with the trade, all south, north, south, east, and west, why had no one heard of it? So, what about modern Mecca? Today, they're now building huge stories, of, huge uh, storied buildings. This uh, building here is the fourth tallest building in the world. It's an enormous clock tower that they have built there overlooking the Kaaba down here. Now they're, they're, they're trying to design it very much like Big Ben in London because they want to make that the center of time. They want to change Greenwich Mean Time and put it to Meccan Mean Time. And so that's why these buildings are being built. What's fascinating, this is the future of Mecca. This is what it's going to look like. These are the four different plans. You can see they're cementing up the entire place. Now, why do you think they're building so many big buildings? Well, obviously because they would say the Hajj is there, but take a look at what they're doing. Here you can see the property where uh, wife Khadija, this is her property. It no longer exists. That's where the Prophet Muhammad supposedly was born and where he grew up. You can see it's now being covered over. Look at all these enormous amount of Cranes, as they're building up, they're going to build 62 of these skyscrapers all around the Kaaba. When you build skyscrapers, you need to have deep foundations, don't you? 
Therefore, you need to dig into the sand. Whenever there is an archaic city, an old city anywhere in the Middle East or anywhere uh, in Europe, what's the first thing you do? You dig foundations, and who are the first people to show up? The archaeologists. Because the archaeologists are licking their lips because as you dig those foundations, you're coming across artifact after artifact after artifact, which recreates the history of the city, and they're doing the job for you. All you do is collect those artifacts and put them into a museum. And that's what's going on here. So the archaeologists are all there licking their lips, and guess what they have found? Nothing. Zero. Proving that there is no history to the city. This history has no city that goes back to the 7th century. Now you can see why they're cementing the whole place up. I think they know what we know. If there's no history, they don't want, they want to destroy the evidence. That's me saying that. I am not saying that others say that. If you have a problem with Mecca, you're going to have an even greater problem with the Qibla. The Qibla is the direction of prayer. You've seen Muslims pray in one direction anywhere in the world. They have to pray towards the Kaaba, towards Mecca. Am I correct? And that's why uh, when you go around the world, there's the Kaaba right there. That's the, the square building they all pray. There it is right there in the, uh, this is the big mosque that's all been built. This is actually an older picture that doesn't have all the skyscrapers around it that have been built. But the Qibla is found anywhere in the world. When I was in Malaysia, it was in my hotel room. Show me where the Qibla was. If you go into a mosque, you find these mihrabs, these little niches in the wall. And that's where you know where to pray. Today you can get it on your app, on your phone app, to find out where the Qibla is. And the reason for that is because five times a day Muslims need to know where Mecca is. So the Qibla is absolutely important for every Muslim everywhere at every time. According to chapter 2, verse 143 to 150 in the Quran, it mentions that the Qibla was changed from Jerusalem down to the Great Mosque, which obviously Muslims believe was Mecca. It doesn't say so in the Quran, but it says they claim it was Mecca. So at one time it did look, it did face one place north and then it was brought back down south again uh, when the Jews rejected Muhammad as a prophet. He then got a revelation from God to change the Qibla back down to the great, the, the, the great mosque. Now what's fascinating, there were some researchers back in the last century, 1905, Dr. Fahervari and Dr. Creswell, who were doing archaeological digs and they went to Iraq and they went to two mosques in Iraq and they dug down to the original floor plans of those mosques and they found that this mosque, these mosques in Kufa and in Wasit, just south of Baghdad today, were facing straight west. They should have been facing south. They went to Fustat, which is just outside of Cairo in Egypt, which is the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the town that was built as a, um, for the rulers at that time, garrison town. And they went to the original floor plans of the Fustat Mosque, and they found that the Qibla there is facing straight east. If you look on a map, you'll see the problem. So here's Wasat, there's Kufa, they're facing straight west. They should be facing down here. Here in Fustat in Egypt, they're facing east. They should be down here. So as late as, that's over 100 years ago, they already saw that there was a problem with the Qibla. Now their, their uh, response was, ah, these, this, these must have been facing Jerusalem. That's how they responded. And I remember doing a debate in 1998 where I said the same thing. I was quoting them and I said, if you look at the mosque in Wasit and Kufa and in Fustat, they're all facing Jerusalem. And I got hammered by that. The Muslims got up there and they just hammered me. And they said, Jay, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're three to five degrees off. And I said, oh, okay. I should have taken them at their words and I should have found out why I was three to five degrees off. And they were correct. I was three to five degrees off. But back then I didn't, hadn't met Dan Gibson yet. So I didn't know why I was three to five degrees off. I just realized that they were very clumsy. They were, so they were three to five degrees off. That's close enough. But they certainly weren't facing Mecca. Okay? So we've known about this for over a hundred years. Patricia Crone knew about it, but she didn't know how to come to any conclusion. She just assumed, like everybody, that the earliest Arabs didn't know how to do their directions. And so that's why they're, well, 90 degrees off in this case, but three to five degrees if you're, not, if you're talking about Jerusalem. Even Jacob of Edessa in 705, so this is the 8th century, mentions that he says to about the Magre, saying, so from all this it is clear that it is not to the south that the Jews and the Magre, the Magre is the name that is given to Arabs, remember, uh, this is the name that was given to them because that's where they're from, here in the regions of Syria pray, but towards Jerusalem or the Kaaba, even he thought it was Jerusalem back in the 8th century. 
It wasn't until Dan Gibson finally got on the scene and started doing his research from 1979 to 2004 that suddenly we started to see a clearer picture. And he went to every one of these mosques because he was curious as to why so many of these mosques were misdirected. And he thought they couldn't have been that bad because these were desert caravans, camel herders. They didn't have roads back then. These were Nabataeans. The Nabataeans were famous. They were the ones that took the goods all the way over to Baghdad and beyond because they were the only ones that could, tra could transverse the, the desert without ever getting lost. Because remember, in the desert you have huge winds and every time the winds come it changes the sand dunes. So you cannot have locations on, unless, of course, you're using the stars. So if they, were that, if they knew how to get from one place to the other, if you can't get to an oasis, you die. They were absolutely dependent on getting knowing where their direction was. How could they be so off in all of these directions? So he decided to go and look to every one of these places. And he went to around 65 mosques. I'm going to show you 23 of them now. And what we're going to do, everything that I'm doing from here on out is from Dan Gibson. All right. So you can go up on his site, go up on Dan Gibson's site and look at his material. But also get his books. These are the books that he wrote. Let me just go back here. No, I don't have it here. I thought I had it here. Did I not show his books? Before that even? Way back here. My goodness. There we go. These are the books you need to get. The Nabataeans wrote in 2003 where he first came out and showed that almost everything we know about Arab, the uh, Muslim world today is dependent on the Nabataean world. The language, Arabic, comes from the Nabataean script. The name Allah comes from the Nabataean God. It's a generic title, the God, Ilaha of whom Dushara is the proper name, Ilaha is no, no longer, is only his generic title. So most of what we know about Islam comes from the Nabataeans, who were way much farther north. But let's, don't worry about that now, we're going to come back to that. Ge Quranic Geography then came out in 2011, where he really unpacked the geographical problems with this book. And uh, that was a huge uh, eye-opener. But then he did the Sacred City in 2016, and then he finally came with this book two years ago, 2017. Since this book has come out, many researchers have really attacked Dan Gibson because people like Dr. Dan David King, who did his whole career as the world authority on the Qibla, but never went to those places himself. He, well, he may have gone to some, but he never really did any of a uh, forensic testing like Dan did, has been just abs and he's at the end of his career. Can you imagine his whole career is now in jeopardy? So you can see the problem. There has been an awful lot of anger as to what Dan is saying. So what Dan has done, you need to go up on his site, Dan Gibson, this, is a, this year, and he is now taking all their accusations and giving responses to them. So I'm going to help you with the responses. But he still has another four or five videos to put up, so even next year we'll have even more responses. And uh, this is why it, this, it's, it's back and forth as, we're ha as is going on right. This is what we call peer-reviewed. He's getting peer-reviewed as he goes as being confronted. So let's now jump ahead to what we're going back and let's go through these slides real quickly. So we come to Dan Gibson's Kiblas. Now this is what he found. On the ground, he went to the maps of the area, accumulated the historical data of the area, and measured the GPS coordinates from outside and inside the building. So he would go to the situ and he'd do, he would not use Google Maps. I know the Muslims have hammered him saying all he's using is Google Maps. Why would you not use Google Maps? Western American product. It has nothing to do with America. Google Maps does not take the curvature of the earth into consideration. That's right. It's just flat. It's only interested in going from A to B. It's not interested in the curvature of the earth. So therefore, and rightly so, when the Muslims say, ah, you've just used Google Maps, that's why you've got your, your coordinates wrong. He was not that stupid. He did not use Google Maps. He used advanced thermal emission and reflection radiometer, the Aster satellites, which are the most sophisticated satellites put up by the Japanese. They are, what they do, the advanced space run thermal emission and reflection radiometer obtains high resolution, 15 to 20 square meters per pixel, images of the Earth in 14 different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, ranging from the visible to the thermal infrared light Scientists use Aster data to create detailed maps of land surface temperature and uh, emissivity, reflective and elevation. Aster is the only high spatial resolution instrument in the Terra platform. It collects an average of eight minutes of data per orbit. 
So it's always taking pictures of the Earth's surface. That's why he had to go to the best. Now you have to pay for that, and of course it costs an awful lot of money. But because of the fact he wanted to make sure his coordinates were absolutely accurate, he used them. Often, and what he would do, he would then look at the, from the satellite looking straight down onto the mosque and make sure he got the Qibla line. He already had been there. He knew where the Qibla was. He had seen the Qibla line. It's very easy to find a Qibla on, uh, on, on a building because it's either one of two walls. It's either this wall or this wall or this wall or this wall. I mean, the same thing. Those two walls go the same direction. These two walls. So you really only have two to choose from. And it's always the longest wall, all right? because that's what the hot mosques are made. They're not like churches. Ours are with a, in a cross formation looking towards the front. The Qibla wants a long line of men who are standing side by side. So the Qibla wall is either one direction or one direction, 90 uh, degrees off. And so it was fascinating because he could find the Qiblas quite easily. Then what he would do is he would find that wall and he'd look down from the, from the space, looking down onto it, and then take the coordinates from space, proving how accurate his material is. So he used on his, if you want to go up and question his material, you can go up on his website, the sacredcity.canada uh, on the website. So go up there and look at it and look and see how he goes into it more specifically than what I'm showing today. Now the twos here in this site help you find every known early mosque Qibla in the first 200 years of Islam. Go to data on his site and then early Qibla tools and then also use the papers and the maps that are up there. Now, for instance, he says, the Yamama al-Kharj uh, mosque is completely covered with sand, so how can we find the Qibla? There's no wall to see anymore. Those who researched this mosque then uncovered it with sand, but on Dan's site, you can zoom in and find the original pictures of that mosque taken by the researchers and then see where the Qibla was as it is uncovered in the picture, okay? Because Muslims have claimed, ah, see, how can you have known where the Qibla, There's, it's all sand. Yes, that is today, but it was uncovered at one time and that's why he knows by looking and seeing when he was there when it was uncovered, he knew where the Qibla wall was at, at that time. So. Another claim is that he was only looking at solstice lines. So what he did, when he first came out of his material, he only had the Qibla lines, and then he also had the Qibla towards Jerusalem, the Qibla towards, uh, the Qibla towards uh, Petra, and the Qibla towards Mecca. He has now added a another dimension, which is these, what they call the solstice lines. Those the, that's the X there, those blue lines, to show you that none of these, none of these mosques follow the solstice line. That has been nothing more than a, the, than a false allegation. This is interesting because that's the Dome of the Rock you're looking at right there. There's the Qibla. But that's not really the Qibla. It's this little mosque to the side that actually has the Qibla in it. And that's the one you need to use. So you need to know the history of all these places to know where there is. So let's look at these mosques. And let's start with this one here. This is known as the Qiblatain Mosque. Now, many early mosques don't have Qiblas to help us because they have been rebuilt many centuries later. And the original floor plans and structures have been lost. Other mosques have been rebuilt, but we can see where the original plans still are. The Qiblatain Mosque in Medina is a case in point. We only know this Qibla here. And so it's, but it's called Qiblatain, which means the Mosque of Two Qiblas. Or in the name of the mosque, you can see that that suggests that there was another Qibla at another time. And it was not till 1987 that they were enlarging the mosque. And as they started digging down to do the enlargement, they came across an entire structure right here showing the first Qibla. But take a look at what direction it's going. It's going in almost exact opposite direction from the existing Qibla that's there today. And the Qiblatain Mosque is in Medina, just north of Mecca. Today it's directed towards Mecca, but the earliest Qibla did not direct towards Mecca. So where was it directed towards? Well, if you pull back and you look and see, See where it's directed towards? Now, when it first, when in 1987, when they saw it, they thought it was Jerusalem. Because, as you can see, it is pretty much going towards, although it's about, off by about a degree or two from Jerusalem. But look what else it's more directed towards. Petra. Hold that under your hat. So, the great mosque of Guangzhou in Canton. This is thousands of miles away. This is in China. Look at the Qibla there. It's directed towards Petra. There you can see, if you look at the red line, that's the archaic, that's the Qibla that's still there. And that mosque still exists today. It hasn't been destroyed or rebuilt. In Canton, what we call Guangzhou is the Chinese name. 
Look at this mosque here in Sherman. Now we're in India. In six, look at the date, 629. Muhammad's still living at this time, if he was living. Nonetheless, according to their tradition, he'd be living because he didn't die until 632. So here's a mosque. In fact, this one also, this one here is 627. So this is while Muhammad's still living. So here you have mosques at the time that Muhammad's still living that are not directed toward where he's living, if he was from Mecca. They're too far north. They're 600 miles. They're directed 600 miles further north. Chatamon, Masjid in India, 629, directed towards Petra. Jami Hama Al-Kabir Mosque in Syria, 637. Now Muhammad is dead. He's been dead for five years. Look where it's directed. Petra. Now we go to Egypt. The Fustat Mosque. Remember the ones that the Fahravadi and Creswell found in 1905? Well, they thought it was towards Jerusalem. It was not towards Jerusalem. Gibson found it. They were actually directed towards that. Those mosques were directed towards the Petra. The Dome of the Rock. There's the Dome of the Rock right there. Now, he has a question mark here because that really is not a Qibla. And what's more, that was built in 19, I'm sorry, 18, I want to say 76 or 1886. So, a little over 100 years ago. The Dome of the Rock has been built and rebuilt 11 times. So, the outer structure that you're looking at, including the dome itself, were a little over 100 years old. 100 over a little 100 years old, they then put the Qibla on that. But that wasn't there for the original structure. That's why Muslims have hounded me on that. I said, okay, but then take a look at the entire citadel. Which way is it directed? Straight towards Petra. We're going to come to this mosque right here. That's the Alexa Mosque, built in 709 in the 8th century. So that's built in 691. This is built in 709. So now we're in the 8th century, and look what direction it's facing. Petra, not Mecca. You can't destroy it and rebuild it again. That's the problem. The Humayma Mosque in Jordan, built 699. So we're now at the end of the 7th century. It's directed towards Petra. The Amman Mosque in Jordan. So we've been in Syria. We've now been in Israel. Now we're into Jordan. We've been into India. We've been into China. All these mosques from all over the world facing Petra. Now we're into the 8th century, 705. We're now to Yemen, a whole other country. This is the Grand Mosque in Sana'a. It's facing Petra. Petra. The Kirbat al minya Mosque in Israel, 706. It's facing Petra. Take a look at all these mosques. I'm just going to pull back, pull back, and now come forward. Notice where they're all coming in. So these are the mosques that we've looked at coming from all over the world. They're all coming right to Petra. There's a map of them. Medina, China, India, Syria, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Yemen, all these countries, these mosques from all over, not one of them is facing Mecca. They're all facing Petra. Up till 706, every mosque is facing Petra. <coughs> so far, no mosque has been found that's facing anywhere else but Petra. Are you following that? Muhammad died in 632. The mosque was canonized according to Islamic tradition in 624. So, we're talking almost, we're talking, we're coming up with about 80 years later. They're still all facing Petra, according to the archaeological finds. Here's a look of looking down straight on him. And you can see that all the 17 Petrid Qiblas fall within a 45-mile dotted circle, proving how accurate they were. This will become important later on. Then in 706, a new mosque with a completely different Qibla was discovered. And it's somewhere in between, almost halfway between Petra and Mecca, you get a new Qibla. This is Qibla number two. All right? But there's nothing there. That's curious. Hold on to that. I'll show you why. Back in 708, another mosque. This is in Iran. It's facing Petra again. The Alexa Mosque, as I said earlier, in Jerusalem, Israel, 709. It's facing Petra, like the Dome of the Rock, like the entire citadel. If you look at it, you can see here, here is the Alexa Mosque, there's the Dome of the Rock, and you can see the Qibla is in the red. It should be in black, it should be going that direction. It's actually comp uh, off by those degrees there. Now, when you get to Damascus in Syria, the Jama... Jama Jamie, I should have you read this, because you're, you're... What does that say in Arabic so I don't des desecrate your language? Jamaya. Umawi al-Kabir. Yeah. Damascus, 7 right. In between again, here's the second one that's in between, almost exactly the same place as the earlier one. 
Then we get the Kirbat al Mafjar in Jericho in Israel, back to Petra again. Can you see? Mecca, well, let's go back here. Mecca is the almost exact opposite direction. Can you see that right there? That's Mecca today. That's where the mosque is directed in the red line. The Anjar Mosque in Lebanon in 714, Petra again. The Mosque of Umar, Basra Siri. Then we come to the in between mark. Now we're in 721. We're now almost 100 years later. Still, no mosque is facing Mecca. Dahar al Gharbil Mosque in Syria, 726, in between. It's not till we get to this mosque, 727. Look at the date. Now we're over 100 years later. The first mosque we have been able to find that's facing Mecca. The, this is the third Qibla. So this is now Qibla number three. The first Qibla, number one, is Petra. The second is in between. The third is Mecca. Mecca is introduced in 727. Here's the Qas al al Sharqi Mosque in Syria, 728. It's in between. The Amman Citadel Mosque, Jordan, 730. It's in Mecca. Now take a look at this. I want you to look at this a little bit better. Let's look at this next picture. Remember right in 701, I said that this one down here was facing Mecca, and it still is. It's the older mosque. In 701, that one faced Petra. Sorry, did I say Mecca? Petra. That's facing Petra. They then rebuilt this mosque up here behind it and above it. That's 730. That's facing Mecca. So something has happened between 701 and 730. Both mosques are still there today. So the evidence, you can't destroy the evidence proving that something happened that changed the Qibla between 701 and 730. That's why this one's such a good one, because you can see both mosques in the same area, proving that there was a change of direction between 701 and 730. Hold that under your hat. The Jami al Zaituna Mosque in Tunisia. Now we get a fourth Qibla. All the mosques that he found in North Africa and in Spain are facing straight south, parallel to a line that goes between Petra and Mecca. Ooh, two, two, two. Why? Four Qiblas. Petra, in between, Mecca, parallel. This is a four Qibla number four. Baalbek Mosque in Lebanon, in between, 740. The Mushta Mosque in Amman, Jordan, 743. Petra again. So here Petra raises its head again. Look at the date, 743. This is 120 years after the, the, the Qibla was supposed to have been canonized towards Mecca. The Haran Mosque in Turkey, way up in Turkey, in between, not Mecca. Qasar al Qaidar al Kufar Mosque, there's one that is facing Mecca, 764. The Ribat Mosque in Tunisia, remember I said all the ones in North Africa are facing parallel, not in between, not Petra nor Mecca. The Sahih Ramda Baur Mosque in Oman. So around 771, we don't, we don't know exact date for that. That is facing Petra again. The Suma'il, Omani Mosque in Oman, around 771, it's facing Petra again. So here's the, still this holdout towards Pe Petra. Why? The Raqqa Mosque in Syria in 772, it's facing in between. The Bibi of Samarkand in Uzbekistan, way over in Uzbekistan, way off to the east, it's facing Petra. Possibly Jerusalem, most people now think it's now Petra. The Cordoba Mosque in Spain, like I said, like North Africa, it's facing parallel. The Jami Ukba Ibn Nafi Ikarwan in Tunisia, again, 836. 836, this is the 9th century, it's parallel, it's not facing Mecca. So, here are the four Qiblas. The Petran Qiblas are always the earliest one. Up until 706, every Qibla was facing Petra. Then they start introducing a second Qibla in between. Then you have the Meccan Mosque, which starts to be introduced in 727. And then the Parallel Mosque, which are in North Africa and Spain that are facing parallel. All the Qiblas were facing towards Petra in 706. There was confusion for the next 100 plus years. 17 faced Petra, 8 are in between, 10 faced Mecca, 6 are parallel. The Qibla was not finalized towards Mecca until 876. After 876, you're talking about the late 9th century, all the mosques then face Mecca. But that's 200, over 240 years too late. 250 years too late, sorry. So let's look at them. Those, that's the first Qibla. See how accurate they are, how specific they are coming right to Petra. And look at, they're all over the world. They're not all in one area. All the way over in Guangzhou, Canton, India. Here in the 
Oman, in Yemen, all the way up here, Bibi Samad Khan in, in, in Uzbekistan. So you can see these are not, spe these are so specific, but they're so accurate from such thousands of miles away. How did they get it that accurate? The second mosque then, take a look how, how they come to one point, but there's nothing there. What's going on here? And then you get the Meccan Qiblas, starting in 727. Then you have these parallel Qiblas, which are up here in North Africa and in Cordoba. This looks like a political statement to me. Hold on, you'll see why. So why are the Qiblas multidirectional? Mountain scholars assume that the variety of Qibla directions were due to the inability of the ancient Arabs of finding accurate Qibla direction. It's ineptitude is what they're saying. They just weren't very accurate. Modern scholars simply quoted earlier 9th century Islamic scholars concerning this theory. And that's the theory that David King has taken, and that's his biggest theory, is the 9th century scholars considered them that they were just inaccurate. But once they got to the Mecca, they were much more accurate. They assumed that the Meccan Qiblas were the most accurate. Well, let's take a look and see how accurate the Meccan Qiblas are. When you look at the, look at the according to the, uh, all the Petrin Qiblas, they were 2.9 degrees of accuracy. If you take out the two, the ones of the two, uh, take out the two worst, it's down to 1.9 degrees off. The in-between were point less than a degree off. They were by far the most accurate. The Meccan ones were 4.78 degrees off. They were by far the least accurate. So this whole theory goes out the window. They didn't get better, they actually got worse. So why were the early Arabs so accurate? Modern Muslim scholars assume the early Arabs were not and that they, were, they didn't have adequate mathematical abilities. Yet what really happened was that the Arabs lost their ability to define directions accurately because Roman roads were introduced which they use and thus they didn't need the stars to guide them. Thus the ability to detect very accurate measurements became lost. The earliest Arabs who built the earliest mosques used astronomy, the study of stars, to find one's direction, not astrology, the use of stars to tell the future. They had to because the trip, their trips across the desert was always across the desert where the sands shift and move and they would die if they didn't know how to find their way. And what they would do is they would use these, these type of things. They would use, uh, to find the north and south, uh, uh, they would always use the north star, which never moves. And they used their fingers or the kamal, a block of wood on a string, which measured how far up and down the knots on a string were once that, that block sitting on the horizon reached the North Star. So by pulling the string back, they put it on their horizon, there's the North Star, and as they pulled it back, as it hit the North Star, then they knew where the, the knot was on that string, they knew exactly where the direction was. Something as crude as that, yet saved their lives. For east and west, they needed to use a constant, so they used the number of steps a man walked in order to arrive at his place they were going. Men traveled on foot, while camels were used for carrying the goods. As they walked, they employed poetry, which had a rhythm and a lotted number, of, lotted number for each poem. So when they came to the end, they would know how far they had reached and simply added up the number of times they had recited a certain poem. Thus the reason they chanted poetry as they walked. They still do that today. Now you know why it actually saved their lives to chant this poetry. And that's why poetry was so important for the early Arab, especially those, the traders. Now they used stars to find their direction. They employed 32 stars which were used on a compass to know when they needed to go east and west from their location in relation to the North Star. Thus, for instance, they would walk towards Nakka. There's Nakka, right? Which is a star in the northwestern direction. When they went for a certain number of strides, depending on the poetry they were reciting, they were told, use this poetry, do it 32 times, and you'll get that direction, going towards Naka. Then they turned the other direction. They went towards Altir for a certain number of poet poems. And you go, and now go towards this direction for 10 of these po poems, and in the eastern direction, and so on. And that's how they found their direction. We don't do that today, so we don't understand this. But if you're in the desert war, you better know how to do these directions accurately. And that's why the earliest Qiblas are the most accurate. The later ones, they no longer needed that because now they were using roads, which had it, my, uh, markings on it. So why Petra? Why is Petra so significant? Well, take a look at where Petra is. It's right at the center of all the trade. It was the sanctuary city for the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans did not have their empire. They were traders, so they were all over the world, and they would have families that would stay in different cities in the different trading outposts. Therefore, they did not have any empire or any capital city. 
but they did have sanctuary cities where they would keep tombs and they would have their temples there carved out of sheer rock. You can see if you've been to Petra, these beautiful carving, that's a treasury there. These are the tombs and temples. So it's the city of tombs and temple for the Nabataean people. And whenever someone died, they would send the body back to Petra or Medina Sali. Those are the two major cities of the Nabataean kingdoms. And they would then send them back to have their bodies there. And they would make a pilgrimage back to Petra to then, wor uh, not worship, but to honor their ancestors there. So Petra was the center of the Nabataean kingdom. It was a center of the trading block, the trading routes for all the trade, north, south, east, and west. And it's still there today. But take a look when you go to Petra. Notice that Petra is in a valley. It has a parallel valley. There's the valley. There's the parallel valley. It has a streams. It has whole stream. It, in fact, it has whole waterworks that have been created. Exactly what we're finding in the traditions. It is outside. Outside the ruins would be a pillar of salt. If there would be any pillar of salt, it would be outside the ruins of Petra. It has fields. It is a place where the prophet has trees and grass and, pro and fruit and clay and loam. Everything that the Quran's talking about, everything the traditions are talking about, exists in Petra not in Mecca, and it has olive trees. The one thing you cannot find anywhere in the Arabian Peninsula, you can find in Petra. It has mountains overlooking the Kaaba. So everything that we see, these tradition, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, Al-Tabari, all of them talking about this place where this prophet came from, and they named it as Mecca in the 9th and 10th century. Everything they were looking at, everything they're describing, everything this book describes fits Petra, doesn't fit Mecca. What's fascinating, Petra has all the items listed above. Thus could Petra be the place they are referring to. Remember also the people of Ad, Thamud. 24 times refers to these people from Thamud. 23 times the people from Ad. 7 times the people from Midian. They're all up here around Petra. So if you're going to have any contact, especially as a trader, you'll have contact with all these people. That would make sense. If you're in Petra, it would not make sense if you're way down here, 600 miles further down in Mecca. So why is this significant? Let's review. So far, nothing is known of Muhammad until the late seventh century from within Arab sources. His book, the Quran, is, and its manuscripts don't appear until the early eighth century. His city, Mecca, isn't referred to until the mid eighth century. His biography and his sayings are not, don't even appear until the late eight, early to late ninth century. Thus, much of what we know of Muhammad is written down hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away. Looks like he is nothing more than a later redaction, possibly begun by Abdul al Malik. So, can you now know and understand why Stephen Humphreys, who's a historian, says Islam and the Prophet's life, as we know it, was not derived from the seventh century, but evolved over a period of two to three hundred years and then redacted back, that means put back, on the Prophet's life and compiled in the ninth century. So everything we've known about Islam, everything that I talked about from the very beginning, that classical model, is not from the 7th century, it's from the 9th and 10th century. Do you know why Mecca became so very important for Islam? Why didn't they just take Hold on. That's the next question. You're <laughs> prophetic. You want me to get into that, so let's go into that. We're not finished yet. We still have another half hour. So, here are the questions we need to ask. Why are there no Muslim sources for 200 years, number one? Why do the claims they make not fit the 7th century historical record? Number two, why are the geographical references so few and confusing and why do they all seem to fit an area much further north? Why are so many references to vegetation which would not exist in Mecca and why is Mecca not even on the trade route? Why is Mecca not even mentioned until 741 nor included any maps until 900 AD? Why do all the Qiblas face Petra for the first hundred years? Well, up until 706, then they are confused for the next hundred and aren't standardized to Mecca until 822, 200 years too late. Is it not surprising, therefore, that historians now consider much of what we know about early Islam is possibly histor historically spurious? So, getting to your point, so what really happened? Now, to make sense of this, I'm going to give you the scenario that we think is happening in May 2019. It may change completely by the next year because new material is coming in all the time. So be aware that this is only hypothetical. All right? For those watching, this is hypothetical. This is what Jay Smith is saying, and others are now saying it, but I'm going to say it now on the camera so that you can actually see where we, we're moving and where we, from everything we know so far, this looks like what's happening. To make sense of this, we need to begin with. Abdullah ibn Zubair, who is well known. He was the governor of Petra during the time of Abd al-Malik. 
<coughs> and Marwan before him. You have two great empires that are being created. First you have the Umayyad Empire which starts in 661. There are two families within the Umayyad Empire. You have the Sufyani family that's from 661 up to about 680 and then the Marwans take over. The Marwanids take over in 680. Marwan I is the first king. His son is Abd al-Malik. He's the second king. He comes to power in 685. Now remember, up until that time, the Arabs had destroyed the Sassanids off to the east, which is the Persian Empire, and now their biggest, uh, their biggest enemy, their biggest competitors are the Byzantine Empire to the north. The Sassanids were Zoroastrian. The Byzantines to the north are Christian. They have much more in alliance with the Christians because they trace their lineage back to Abraham. Both the Christians, Jews, and the Arabs trace the lineage back to Abraham. One through Isaac, the other through Ishmael. So they are cousins with the Byzantines. They have nothing to do with the Zoroastrians. Plus, they have already destroyed the Zoroastrians. They're not really a problem for them. Petra, but look and see, and he, let's just go to this map and then I'll come back to this. Take a look and see where their headquarters is. So when you look at their headquarters. Here is Mecca down here, right? If, as the classical account says, that the Umayyads were headquartered down here, then why is it that everybody knows that they weren't living down here? They were up here in Damascus, 1,200 miles further north. What were they doing in Damascus? Why weren't they down in the Hijaz, in Medina? No one's asked that question before. We're asking it. So they're way up here in Damascus. Here's the Byzantine Empire up here and further to the west. Here's the Sassanid Empire over here. Now the Sassanids were destroyed by the Arabs coming up uh, and they took over and they took over Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem and Cairo, all these cities along here, what they call the, the Crescent, the Golden Crescent. All those cities were destroyed by 652. They now control those great five cities of the Levant. But all of the people that, because they were nomadic, they were Arabs, they needed people to run the cities, people who were literate. So the best people to run the cities were the Jews and the Christians that lived there because they were not only literate, they were their cousins via Abraham. So they made the Maulis or Mawalis and that's well documented. They became the ones that ran the cities. The Arabs being nomadic didn't even live in the cities. They didn't like, they were not urban so they lived outside the cities in their own garrison towns. Fustat is the garrison town of Cairo over here. So Fustat is the garrison town where they lived the Jews and the Christians ran the cities for them. Now here's the problem. So from 652 up until 685 when Abdul Malik comes to power, the Jews and the Christians had ran the cities, but yet, hold on a minute, the Arabs were the ones that controlled it. The Jews and Christians have a prophetic line. The Arabs don't. The Jews and the Christians have a scripture. The Arabs don't. Yet you control now the Jews and the Christians, but you don't have the identity that the Jews and the Christians have. So what are you going to do? Abdul Malik knows that. He's been, he's now, he has seen 40 years of Arab dominance. He now moves into Damascus. He's taken over from his father. He owns, owns all that swath of land from all the way from India to Andalusia, which is Spain. From Spain to India was under his control, and yet he has no identity because he has no prophetic line. There is no scripture to the Arabs. They have no scripture. So what are you going to do? You want to create an Arab identity. Hold on to that. So he's, he's up here in Damascus, but his sanctuary is here in Petra. Because he's just taken over the Nabataean sanctuary, which is the sanctuary that all the Nabataeans, who, from which he has derived his power. Their sanctuary is here, and that's why all the mosques all over, from all over are facing Petra. Then in 685, Abdul ibn Zubair rebels against him. He is in Petra. He destroys Petra and takes the black stone and flees to the south. Well documented. Black stone. What's the black stone? Look at the antecedent. It's a Nabataean. It, the black stone is where God's presence is. When he takes God's presence out of Petra, you can see this is a huge flap in the face to the Umayyads. They have to come down, and of course as he's coming down, he, something happens in Damascus. 
Someone is killed, and he has to return. Uh, 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 Abdul Malik has to return back up to Damascus. Never finds Ibn Zubair. So he goes to the south, but we don't know where he goes to in the south. We just know he goes to somewhere in the Hejaz. Now Ibn, uh, uh, Abdul Ibn Zubair, he needs allies against the great Umayyad empire. So who does he look to? Well, he looks over here to Stesiphon which is the archaic name for what is now called Baghdad. So who's over here in Stesiphon? These are the original, these are the Arabs who are then left behind after the Sassanid kingdom is destroyed. They are the ones who are living in Stesiphon. They come to his aid because they hate the Umayyads because they're in competition with the Umayyads. You have the Umayyads here, you have the uh, uh, Abbasids here. So they come and they become an ally with Ibn Zubair. Ibn Zubair looks like, and it looks like now, that's where Mecca then becomes important because they now need to put the black stone in a place, a new sanctuary. So that's why Mecca was chosen. But remember, Mecca has no history. We can't find any history for Mecca. Well, why is Mecca chosen? Take a look at Mecca today. Look and see what Muslims do when they go to Mecca. They go between these two uh, hills, back and forth, seven times. What are those hills for? Well, they say that's where Hagar went to look for water. Why do you commemorate looking for water in these two hills when she never found any water? She found it where the Zamzam well is, according to the tradition. Why do you then circumambulate seven times around the Kaaba? Why do you go out to these three Zamarats and throw seven or 49, up, uh, numbers of seven stones at these three Zamarats? What are these Zamarats? These are devils. Wait, three? I thought there was only one devil. Only one Satan. What does this suggest to you? Looks like this Mecca was a pagan sanctuary, a pre-Islamic pagan sanctuary that did have similar that had enormous importance for the nomads in that period, they have taken over that sanctuary, they've taken the form and they've put their own meanings onto it. So now running back and forth between Marwa and Safa, those two, those two uh, hills now is to commemorate Hagar trying to find water for Ishmael. And the Zamzam well there is where Ishmael, where the water came out so she could feed her son in 1900 BC in a city that didn't even exist until 741 AD. But can you see then why that has been taken over and now everything has been imposed on it? What is fascinating is now the Abbasids have their sanctuary while you have the Umayyads have their pre-existing sanctuary. So here's Abdul Malik. He wants to create an identity. So what's the first thing he does? He coins coins. He mints coins. Now before, if you want to look at the, the numismatic section in the British Museum, you'll go back there and you'll see these coins. These are Byzantine dinars. There's a picture of the emperor with two of his conscripts, and on the back side of the coin is the Byzantine cross. And that's a dinar in the seventh century. Of the, uh, the Sufyanis come into power, the, uh, the Umayyad Caliphate, and they then mint these coins, which are very similar. In order for them to trade, they have to mint, mint the very much the same coins. So now instead of the Byzantine emperor, now you have the Caliph. Mu'awiyah with two of his retainers on either side. On the back side there is the Byzantine cross, but they've taken off the cross, the cross piece. Can you have images on coins? There's a problem with that. That's obviously this is not Islamic. Because no Muslims would have image, any image on any coin. So what are they doing with images on their coins? Obviously, iconoclasm was not a problem for the early Arabs. But then remember, they weren't Muslims. There's, they didn't refer to themselves as Muslims. So then Marwan uh, Abdul Malik comes to power and he takes off his image. The first one is his image. That's Abdul Malik right there with a sword. And there's that Byzantine cross on the back side. So here you have his coin minted between 685 up until 692. Then in 692, he takes off the image and replaces it with Arabic script. And what does he have on that Arabic script? Can any of you read that? Can you read it? Hello. La ilaha illaha Muhammadur Rasulullah. That's the Shahada. That's the first time we see the Shahada introduced on that coin in 692. That's the first time we see Muhammad's name introduced on that coin by Abdul Malik in 692. Look at the date, 692. All right. Now let's go to the Dome of the Rock. Meanwhile, a year earlier, he introduces and puts this building in the middle of Jerusalem. Why in the world does he put it in Jerusalem? Why doesn't he put it in Damascus? The biggest structure of its day, 
the best, most resplendent building of its time, using Byzantine architecture. The ones who built it were Byzantines. But look and see where he puts it. He puts it above the Church of the Sepulchre. There's the Church of the Sepulchre. It looks down onto the Church of the Sepulchre. The Church of the Sepulchre is the sanctuary for the Byzantine, the Christian Byzantines. That's where they go for their pilgrimage. So he's coming into Jerusalem and basically he's saying, we are now the new people on the block. He goes to their sanctuary, builds the largest building, but it has no Qibla. Which is true, it doesn't have a Qibla. The reason why is because the entire citadel is facing their Qibla. It's facing Petra. Can you see what's going on? Now let's go one step further. He employs the Byzantine architecture, much larger and more prominent, and sits above the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the Byzantine Christian sanctuary. It is situated in the holiest city for Jews and Christians. Why should, it should really be in either Damascus or Mecca, unless, of course, he's trying to make a point here. Muslims say it was built there to commemorate the Miraj, the night journey of Muhammad going to the seven heavens in 621. Go look at any of the ambulatories, look at any of the inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock, you won't see any reference to the Miraj at all. No reference. So let's look at the inscriptions. Let's look. Now, the Dome of the Rock, the only part of the rock, of Dome of the Rock that is original are these two ambulatories, these two circular uh, colonnades. All the rest has been rebuilt and built and rebuilt and destroyed 11 times. So the only original part are these two. So that's why you need to look at the inscriptions along there. You need to look at the ones along the top. All those inscriptions there along the outer ambulatory are revealing. When you look at the inscriptions, you will see Surah 4, 171. O people of the scripture, that's us, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter aught concerning Allah. Save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and say not three, cease. It is better for you, Allah is only one God, for is it removed, far is it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. Who is that attacking? Jesus, the Trinity, and his sonship, right? It's attracting his divinity, the sons of Jesus Christ, and the Trinity, all in one verse. So 17, I 11 is there. Praise be to God, who hath not taken unto him a son. There's the sonship. Who hath no partner. There's the idea that God would have, a, uh, that there would be two gods, God the Father and God the Son, in the sovereignty, nor hath he any protecting friend through dependence. Then you get Surah 112. There is no God but God. There is the Shahada. He is one. He has no associates. Attacking Jesus there again. Say he is God, the one. God, the eternally besought of all. He begetteth not, nor was he begotten. There is John 3.16. It's attacking. And there is none comparable unto him. Muhammad is the messenger of God. Here is where Muhammad is introduced. A hundred years, I'm sorry. A year before he's introduced on the coins, he's first introduced on the Dome of the Rock. This is the first reference we have to Muhammad anywhere in the world. I'm sorry, within Arab sources. <laughs> he is actually referred to in other sources outside of Arab sources, like the Doctrine of Jacobi in 634 and the Chronicles of Sabaeus in 660. But this is the first time that we see his name on any Arab inscription. So here, take a look and ask, what does this have to do with the Miraj? This has nothing to do with the Miraz. This has everything to do with Christianity. It's an attack against Jesus. It's an attack against the Trinity. It's an attack against the sons of God. It's an attack against everything we believe. These are the first Quranic verses we can find anywhere. Isn't that interesting? On the Dome of the Rock. Fascinating. So let's move from there and you'll see what's going on. So. Abdul Malik introduces here his Arab identity in the guise of an Arab prophet. Beginning with the Dome of the Rock, it's larger than any other Arab structure. It's facing the Arab sanctuary Petra. It incorporates inscriptions against Byzantine Christianity. It introduces their faith, Islam. It introduces their prophet, Muslim, and, uh, to the, uh, introduces their people, Muslim, and it introduces their prophet, Muhammad. Meanwhile, the caliphal protocols that were being studied by Yehuda Neville, he was there looking at all these caliphal protocols, and he finds the caliphal protocols from the Sufiani family up until the Marwanid family. He finds no bismillah that we find in the Quran today. He has, finds no reference to people called Muslims in them, no reference to any religion called Islam in them, no reference to any man called Muhammad in them, and no reference to any book called the Quran, which should be in all through these material, because these are the first Muslims. It should be replete with references to the word Islam, to the word Muslims, to Muhammad, and to his book, right? 
nothing in any of these Calo for protocols until 691. In 691, the Shahada is introduced into the Calo for protocols overnight. And then from then on, every Calo for protocol starts with the Shahada. Introduced by Abdul Malik the same year that he introduces it on the Dome of the Rock, a year before he introduces it onto the coins. So now you have the building, the inscriptions, the Caliph of Protocols, and the coins now introducing an Arab prophet to the Arab people. Replaces the image uh, with Arabic script and introduces the Shahada on those coins. So once Abdul Malik introduces Muhammad, then he needs to have an Arab revelation. The, this is why the earliest Quranic texts are on the Dome of the Rock, 691. The earliest Quranic manuscripts begin to appear during his reign. The lower text, remember I showed you the palimpsest of Sana? That lower text probably comes from the last two decades, the time Abdul Malik uh, uh, was in power. And you notice it is only 63 verses. There are 70 variants in just those 63 verses. So they have to wash it off and then write over top. The upper layer is from 705, the 8th century. That's the earliest text we have. All the other manuscripts come after 705. Ooh, I love this. So the documentary evidence is supporting what we're now seeing in the archeological evidence, not only from the Dome of the Rock, but also from the documentary evidence of the inscriptions. The earliest Quranic manuscripts begin to appear during his reign. The Quranic manuscripts begin to proliferate during the reign of his son Al-Walid from 705 to 750. Then we see other manuscripts starting to appear. Why weren't they appearing at the time of Uthman in 652? Why are they suddenly appearing in the 8th century? Why so late? Because now they have a prophet. Every prophet has to have a book. Can you then understand when you put a book together, you have to put it together hurriedly. And where do you get your material from? Well, you borrow. That's why 70% of the Quran is borrowed from other sources. Mostly from Jewish apocryphal writings and Christian sectarian writings. They borrowed the wrong material. God bless them. They should have gone back to the Bible. Why didn't they borrow from this book? Because this book was not in Arabic yet. It hadn't been translated into Arabic. This was only translated into Arabic. The earliest document we have for the, uh, the, the Arabic Bible is six, I want to get this right. It's 868, eight, two years before Abdul al-Buhari. Eighth, ninth century. This was not translated into Arabic until the ninth century. And that's the, uh, the Sinaiticus 151, which is in the, the monastery there in Sinai. Now, fascinating. So they didn't have the Arabic Bible to, the, to which to get their material from. Now, can you understand? The Quranic inscriptions begin to proliferate during his reign. None of the manuscripts are complete, nor are they parallel to today's Quran. They continue to be changed and corrected by later caliphs up until the, through the 9th century. The Quran is finally canonized at Al Azhar University in Cairo, just for Cairo in 19, 1924. That's now, uh, this actually should be 95 years ago, but was not canonized for the whole world until 1985, just 34 years ago. But can you see why then once you have the man, once you have the prophet, you need to have a revelation. That's why the Quran had to be proliferated. That's why they had to have a Quran in place quickly. Now, at that time, you have two empires that are, that, uh, com that are competing for an Arab sanctuary. The Umayyads and the early Nabataean sanctuary in Petra is destroyed by an earthquake in 713. Getting back to your question. In 713, once there is an earthquake that which de totally destroys Petra, then God's presence is no longer in Petra. So that's significant. So that pretty much weakens the, the uh, ascendancy of the Umayyads. And that's why, really, you can see now, they know if they have no longer sanctuary, they no longer have any theological legitimacy. That's important. Thus a new place is needed and that's why Mecca is first noted in 727, possibly chosen by the rebel Abdul Ibn Zubair 687 and his allies from Kufa, the Abbasids, in defiance of the Umayyads in Petra. The Abbasids and Zubair, with their sanctuary in Mecca, then demand allegiance to the surrounding tribes. All of those Qiblas facing Mecca are those who ally themselves with the Abbasids. So this is a political statement. Al-Hajjaj, however, remember, Al-Hajjaj is a governor in, over in Kufa. In 706, he rebels against Abdul al-Malik. Well, actually, Marwan, because 706, uh, uh, Marwan comes to power, uh, uh, Walid comes to power, excuse me, Walid. He rebels in 706 against both, and it is his mosques which are facing in between. So he's demanded that all the mosques face not Petra nor Mecca, because he's making a political statement. He wants to see who's going to win out. Who is going to be the one? He's being, basically, he is being clever. 
This is what you do when you don't want to lie with either one. You want to see who's going to win out. And that's why, as a rebel, he does not like Abdul Malik. He does not like the Marwan family. And so his mosques are facing, really, a piece of desert in the sand. No re significance other than they're halfway in between. Now, that's fascinating because they continue to face somewhere in between until he dies in 744. And when he dies, his Qiblas die with him. That's the second Qibla. Those in North Africa and Andalusia don't show allegiance to either empire, so they have mosques facing parallel. They are waiting to see who's going to win out, and that's why all their mosques are facing straight south, parallel to the line between Petra and Mecca. When the Abbasids finally overpowered the Umayyads in 749, most of the Qiblas then faced Mecca, with a few holdouts until 822, after which they all faced Mecca. So the ones that you see that still come out after 749 are those who still have allegiance to the Umayyads, but they're dwindling in power. The Abbasids are, coming, are gaining in power. So, this is nothing more than a political statement. So here's what the what if if possibility. Now that the Muslims have a prophet called Muhammad, his name is now introduced in 691, a revelation in the Quran, which is starting to be introduced in 705, a sanctuary called Mecca, which according to documentation is not referred to until 741, but looks like it, co it comes into, uh, into existence around between 713 and 727, because the first mosque that's facing Mecca is 727. They then need a history. Now can you understand why the histories only begin to appear in the ninth century? It takes him a hundred years to finally introduce the Siddha, the biography of this prophet. It takes him another 240 years to introduce the Hadith, the sayings in 870, and then the Tafsir is introduced in 923. So by the ninth century, they then have the book, the man, the place, and the story. And a new religion is formed and growing, yet not something that was created in 22 years, like Muslims like to tell us, it took two to three hundred years to do this. What did they do with all those that disagreed? They eradicated and burned anything that disagreed with that narrative. That's why you have wholesale destruction of other texts. Now that's actually in Al-Bukhari. Bukhari does talk about that, but he puts it at Uthman's time when he says that all the manuscripts were destroyed. No, that probably didn't ever happen. There was no manuscript at the time of Uthman. But what he is saying is, this is very clear, the Abbasids then destroyed anything that disagreed with this narrative. That's why you can burn books, but you can't burn buildings, and you can't destroy artifacts. And that's why the Qibla is so damaging, and that's why the problem with Mecca is even more damaging. So, summation. Why are there no Muslim sources for 200 years? Why do the claims they make not fit the historical record? Why are the geographical references so few and confusing? Why do they all seem to be much further north? And why are there so many references to vegetation which would not exist in Mecca? And why is Mecca not mentioned until 741, nor included in any maps until 900? Why is Mecca not even on the international trade route? Why do all the Qiblas face Petra up until 706, then are confused for the next 100 years up until 8, 822, and then finally canonize in around 822 to 847, 200 years too late? Why, what is Abdul Malik's role in all of this? And does this not show that what he was introducing was a nascent Quran, the beginning of the Quran, of the Islam, and the reason why he's beginning it, because he's creating an Arab identity. Now can you see, when you read the, the Quran, you notice over and over again, it says this is an Arab book in the Arab language for the Arab people. Now can you see why there's so much emphasis in Arabic? Now can you see why you can only read this in Arabic? And why, even as you know, as an Iranian, the Arabs are always elevated above all other people. It's very, it's very racist, isn't it? The Arab world always sees themselves as superior because that Arab identity was created by Abdul Malik himself. And that's why the Arab language then was introduced on all the coins in 691 as a script that became the script for all people in all places in all time. So with that in mind, what are we going to do with Muhammad? How should we critique him, considering this new information we now have about him? Since much of what we know about early Islam is in doubt, since much of the Quran is also in doubt, since nothing is known of Muhammad until late the late 7th century, or Mecca until the mid-8th century, or his story until the 9th century, hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away, can we therefore conclude that Islam is nothing more than a later redaction possibly begun by Abdul Malik, then continued by his descendants, proving Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran, so who is he and what is his purpose? It looks like Muhammad has, is the wrong man at the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. But I like to end with Jesus. How should we critique Jesus? Using the same historical criteria we use for Muhammad, 
We know where Jesus was born, Bethlehem. We know where Jesus grew up, Nazareth. We know where Jesus died and, then, uh, and when in Jerusalem. We know what Jesus did for the last three years of his ministry. We know this all from eyewitness account, Matthew and John. We know this all uh, from hostile accounts. Even people like Thallus, Tacitus, and Josephus do talk about that death there on the cross. We know when they were written, between 15 and 60 years for their gospel accounts in the New Testament. We know that the few, there, that few doubt his historicity, proving that we have the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. Hallelujah. Like with like. So, where to from here? We must confront Islam's historical foundations. I don't think we have a choice, any other choice but to. More than that, we must challenge Muhammad in the Quran. This material is too damaging and too important. Yes, it is controversial. Yes, it is confrontational. We must demand that the same of all books, not just the Quran, not just the Bible, the Upanishads, the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, the Book of Mormon, all have to go through the same test that I've just given to Islam. And we must bring it into the public sphere. Too many do not want this to be known. Like Dr. Gerald Hodding, he did not want me to go down to Speaker's Corner. I said, I'm not asking you to do it, let us do it. And really, this is something that we have to do. Because we're the only ones that have an antidote. The Gerald Hottings, the Bishop Crohn's have nothing to offer Muslims, we do. Because the very same questions I've asked today of Islam have been asked of this book and about our Lord Jesus Christ. We have answered every one of those criticisms. We created the criticisms. Looking at the Bible, looking at Jesus, looking at early Christianity, redacted criticism, source criticism, literary criticism, historical criticism would not exist without Christianity mostly done by Christian scholars. Can you then understand why we are the best equipped? Because not only do we understand the material better, we are the only ones that have an antidote. We have the only alternative. We need to bring them home.